we, uh, we have chapters uh, across the globe. I end up being on meetings uh, with people from South Africa and Australia and Spain and Argentina. It's, it's really quite, quite a vast uh, group of people who are interested in, in restoration of native e natural ecosystems. Um, in the Great Basin chapter has been around for about 12 years now. We focus on the sort of the geographic ecological province. So not quite the geologic definition of the Great Basin. We go north and west of that, but I'll focus on the province that, uh, you know, that covers Idaho, Nevada, Oregon, Utah, and California rangelands. And so our mission is consistent with that of the National Global Society, which is to encourage the development of ecological restoration, uh, including management of, of lands to further um, restoration goals. And restoration, we see restoration as a scientific and technical discipline, which will be a lot of the focus of today's presentations. It's also a strategy for guiding ecological research and it's a way to develop a mutually beneficial relationship between humans and the rest of nature. So um, we, we look at, at restoration globally, both as, as a profession, as a object of study, and, and as a duty as, um, as citizens of the earth. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Mark Brunson. I'm the um, professor at Utah State University, and I am currently the president of the society or the chapter. And so I wanted to recognize those of us who um, have been serving in that capacity. That uh, includes, uh, besides myself, we don't currently have a vice president, uh, <clears throat> although one would be welcome and we will have elections um, soon. So that would be an opportunity um, our past president, Trevor Coughlin, has been, been very active in, in furthering the goals even after he stopped being president. Owen Boffman is our secretary treasurer. And then we have um, members of the board of directors who um, come from different agencies, not because they're here as representatives, but simply because we have this breadth of, of interest. So Anna Halford, Sarah Barge, uh, Beth Newingham, and uh, we also invite participation in uh, board activities by the student chapter leaders from our three student chapters at Brigham Young University, the University of Nevada, Reno, and Utah State University. Um, I want to say a special thank you to the people who helped make this conference um, come together. Um, the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange, which uh, many of you probably are familiar with, but perhaps not all. Um, it's an organization funded by um, the Joint Fire Science Program jointly between Forest Service and, and the Department of Interior. Uh, it's actually part of the Bureau of Land Management. Um, <clears throat> Great Basin Fire Science Exchange uh, has been Working with us, Corey Gucker and Janie Montblanc have been helping with um, registration and will be um, hosting this webinar for us. Uh, Corey and Sarah Barge will be handling in-meeting logistics. So um, we've had a little bit of a learning curve. We had more people sign up for this than we had thought we would. And so um, we had to switch yesterday um, how we were going to operate this and it seems to be working so I'm um, uh, thanks to, to Corey and and Sarah will be monitoring the chat or the chat in the uh, Q&A so that uh, make sure that those of you who have questions will get them uh, addressed and then I also want to thank the people who agreed to speak um, I feel like we have a really good um, roster of speakers to present to you today <clears throat> You'll see that primarily, um, you know, they come from universities and uh, and federal agencies. I'll introduce our keynote speaker in a couple of minutes. 
uh, but we'll be hearing from from folks from USDA, from from US Geological Survey, from uh, a number of universities across the uh, across the Great Basin and, and even beyond. Uh, in the case of Sophia Kutsukas, who was was at Utah State University and and is now um, moved east, at least in in employment, if not in person. <laughs> I want to also. Um, let you know about that we will be having a chapter business meeting at noon. Uh, so if you're a member of the Society of, um, for Ecological Restoration, or even if you're not, if you, we'd welcome to have you come and sit in on our chapter business meeting that occurs at one o'clock. So you'll see that, you know, we go for now, we'll go from, from now until 1045. Uh, so a little over an hour, then we have a 15 minute break, then we'll come back with three talks and then the business meeting, another break. Uh, before we have our last set of six 20-minute talks. So we'll be done um, about 3.15 Mountain Time, uh, 2.15 Pacific Time. And then the last thing I wanted to mention was that we are using the webinar pl platform in Zoom. And so that means that both the chat and the comment, or the chat and the Q&A functions will be operating. And we ask that, you know, the chat is, is a great way to sort of, you know, check in with us, uh, talk about who, who we are, um, you, know, you know, any comments that you may have, uh, and use the Q&A if you can remember to do that for questions for the speakers. And then that way we'll be able to, to make sure that we uh, are connected, you know, so that the, your questions are, are we're sure to, we'll be sure to see them. And so with that. Mark? Yes. Can we ask uh, the attendees to type their name and affiliation in the chat? That will just give a better sense of community. Um, folks can't see that because of the change in format. Okay. Great. Well, I'm gonna stop sharing here and we will move to um, our keynote presentation and I'm I'm excited for this. Uh, <clears throat> our keynote speaker is, is Dr. Allison Anyre. Um, she is the Great Basin Eco-Regional Coordinator for the Bureau of Land Management. And so her job um, entails working to implement the Native Plant Materials Development Program for the Great Basin Desert. So she's part of a team that advances native plant community conservation and restoration throughout our region through development of native plant materials by seed transfer zones. Um, before that, Allison worked for 10 years executing long range research and monitoring programs across the West uh, and completed her doctorate, probably what, three years now, I think, something like that. I graduated last year. Oh, last year. <laughs> yeah, okay. last April. Yeah. I guess I uh, working at, at the University of Nevada, Reno, um, looking at, at native seed mixes and evaluating seed sources for their use and restoring the most degraded um, habitats of Nevada. So, Allison, go for it. Thank you, Mark. Okay, share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen okay? I can, yes. You can. Okay, excellent. So thank you for having me today. And thank you, Mark, for that really lovely introduction. I'm super grateful to be working with the BLM now across our region. So I'm based in the Nevada State Office in Reno, but um, my area is the entire sort of Great Basin area um, to help build a restoration network and also overcome all the obstacles that the BLM still faces to successfully using native seeds um, in our area. So I have the honor of being the first to talk today. So I get to start from the beginning, which is where exactly is the Great Basin. So we all work and probably live in this incredible region um, that spans five Western United States. And the bulk of the Great Basin is found in Nevada, followed by Idaho, Utah, Oregon, and California. And this area is a high elevation cold desert, as we should all know by now. And it is characterized by these series of low basins and high mountain ranges with Nevada actually being the most mountainous state in the United States with over 300 unique 
mountain ranges. I love to say that all the time. So anyways, um, this dense, complicated topography really contributes to the Great Basin having an incredible legacy of diversity, um, ranging from our low salt desert valleys or salt deserts in the valleys up to more mid-mountain sort of sagebrush communities and all the way up to alpine um, communities at the mountaintops, plus a ton of others. I'm just simplifying this here. Um, but all of these diverse plant communities support healthy and diverse wildlife species that rely on all of these intact habitats to survive. And even though we often focus on sage grouse as a sort of indicator species, I still like to highlight all the other wonderful critters out there. Um, and this region is also extremely unique because it is dominated by public lands. Um, namely, it's administered by the Bureau of Land Management. And since the BLM works under a multiple use mandate, that means that our public lands are used for many, many reasons and purposes, ranging from grazing to mining and hunting and recreation, um, including Burning Man, which uh, fun fact, Black Rock City becomes the third largest metro area in Nevada for one week every single year, and that's all on BLM land. Um, so many of these incredible lands, as we all know, are facing unprecedented pressure from disturbances like drought, wildfire, and invasive species, just to name a few examples. In response, we as land managers are spending an unprecedented amount of money to rehabilitate and restore these degraded areas to try and bring back desirable plant species so we can improve forage and provide habitat. Um, recent estimates that I've seen show that sagebrush, just as one key um, species, is now on less than 55% of its historical extent. And much of that loss is due to fire and um, invasive species. So what do I mean when I say we're trying to rehabilitate and restore ecosystems. So I like to reference SCR's restorative continuum for this, and this is from the International Principles and Standards on Restoration. Um, and this really shows sort of the more realistic trajectory that to go from repairing degraded ecosystems, um, since we can't expect to go from a completely converted degraded site to a fully recovered native system. You, there are steps sort of in between. Um, ecological restoration is considered sort of the, the final series of steps in this process where we're truly trying to create conditions that are needed for full recovery and to try to um, help ecosystems return to their historic trajectory, as opposed to say rehabilitation or remediation, which are sort of lower down on this continuum. And that's where we're solely, you know, focusing on things like repairing ecosystem function. So that would be like seeding, you know, just grass species after a fire for say site stabilization. Um, and those are really common remediation and rehabilitation practices for the BLM. But um, I want to talk more about what does it take to move us more down this continuum towards ecological restoration. Um, so trying to reestablish diverse native plants on damaged landscapes is a fundamental practice of all ecological restoration efforts. Um, our native plants are the true sort of green infrastructure, as we like to say, um, that we rely on to sustain healthy biodiverse ecosystems. And without native seeds or plant materials to introduce back on these landscapes wh when it's needed, we can never fully restore functional ecosystems and that can have cascading impacts on these regions. Um, so what has the BLM been doing uh, as you know, a program in the Great Basin? So here's just a little timeline of my program within the Bureau, and I've only been here for about a year. Um, so a lot of this happened much, much before uh, my time. So back in the, the 90s, the Plant Conservation Alliance was founded to to build a framework for plant conservation across the nation. So that was nationwide. And in that same decade, we were really slammed with a series of large wildfires that started to catch the attention of DC. Um, and the White House issued the first executive order that really urged federal agencies to start prioritizing native species and reseeding. Um, then in about 2001, the Great Basin Restoration Initiative was started by uh, my predecessor's predecessor, Mike Pallant. Um, and that was, I think, the very first eco-regional restoration effort within the BLM. 
Um, around the same time, the BLM also worked with Nancy Shaw at the Forest Service to set up the really collaborative Great Basin Native Plant Project that was also in 2001. Fast forward to 2015, the PCA released the National Seed Strategy, which still guides all of our work today um, and is currently undergoing an update. Then if you fast forward to, you know, today, where are we? You know, we have not only the Great Basin Ecoregional Program, we have uh, the Mojave and the Colorado Plateau programs. We also have uh, the Nevada Native Seed Partnership um, to kind of conduct this work on a statewide level uh, across, you know, federal and uh, state and uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, we also have expanded the Great Basin Native Plant Project to include the Fish and Wildlife Service. And we also find ourselves um, as in the United Nations decade on ecosystem restoration. So this has become a global effort. It's not just happening here in the Great Basin. Um, so I mentioned that national seed strategy, which was started by the Plant Conservation Alliance. And I encourage you to get on their mailing list if you aren't already, since they offer a lot of great meetings, um, job and funding opportunities. They also just provide a nice context for what's happening at the national scale. Um, and you'll see that in my talks, I included some QR codes, hopefully to make it easy for you to find um, the information that I'm citing on the slide. But you I'll have my email at the end and you can send me an email if you want more information or you missed something. I'm happy to share all of that. Um, anyway, so this strategy's intent is to build a national coordinated network of partners to really increase the nation's um, collection, propagation, storage, distribution, research, and restoration of native seeds and plant materials. So it's really an attempt to unite all of these amazing sort of grassroots plant initiatives that are happening across the nation and join all these partners together so we can move in the kind of same direction all together um, with the vision, the shared vision of putting the right seed in the right place at the right time. And I also think it's a point of national pride because the U.S. was actually the first country to develop a national seed strategy. And it's looking like Canada might be the next. Um, and a few other countries have drafts in the works, but they're all kind of using our standard as um, a sort of starting point and learning from us. So I'm pretty proud of that. Um, so after all of this time and all this effort, how much native seed is the BLM using? Well, according to a recent national report, we are the largest user of native seeds in the country um, and currently have the largest capacity for storage of seed as well. So here are just some sort of recent statistics from our BLM seed warehouses in Boise and Ely. Um, I wanna note that the BLM also purchases seed from the Ephraim warehouse in Utah and a few other suppliers. So this isn't a complete sort of uh, snapshot of how BLM uses seed, but it gives you an idea. And you can see that of the seed we do buy, um, we've done a pretty decent job of switching over to using native species. And you can see on this um, left side of the pie chart that from 2015 to 2020, we purchased 67.5% uh, native species. And then over on the right, you can see how this broke down between grasses, shrubs, and forbs. So you can see, you know, from this snapshot that we're still lagging in creating super diverse seed mixes. We tend to still rely heavily on grasses, um, but they are mostly native at this point. And I wanna say that on a almost a weekly basis at this point, I still hear that natives don't work. You know, Allison, these species don't work here because it's too hot, it's too dry, too invasive. Um, and I've met with a ton of people who tell me how, you know, they tr they're trying to use native species and they want to use them, but they're just not even outperforming the non-natives that get included in seed mixes. So, and they're more expensive. So it's like, Allison, why should we be using these native species? Well, you know, I can't necessarily argue with those results that people are getting, but I do want to add that we really need to consider, you know, where are we pulling these native species and what are their histories? Um, here's just a map that shows the top 15 or so varieties um, of native species that the BLM uh, supplied in 2021. And these are just centroids from where the cultivars originated. And that's a tricky sort of thing to do because many of these cultivars are sourced from dozens of populations and represent sort of novel 
um, types that aren't necessarily specific to a single site, but I still think it's important to see generally where are these coming from. Um, for instance, the Tetra wild rye is actually sourced from 31 sites across the Great Basin from Oregon over to Utah, but I've just kind of stuck it right in the middle, but just to give you an idea. Um, and the green dash line in this map is an outline of the Great Basin Desert. Um, so of these 15, the top five species that folks worked with um, were Columbia and Anatone Blue Bunch from up near the Idaho-Washington border, followed by uh, Seacar native or Snake River wheatgrass, and that's a species that isn't even naturally found in the Great Basin, um, followed by Sherman Bluegrass from over North Oregon, and Toejam Toe Creek Squirreltail, which was actually um, the top cultivar sourced actually within the Great Basin from the Elko area. So all of these other cultivars that are found in the Great Basin, like Turkey Lake, Mountain Home, Tetra, those are all fairly new to the market still, and they're still starting to gain in popularity. Um, but I wanna say, when I see this map, what I see is that we are really still missing appropriate plant material options for much of the Great Basin, particularly our more central kind of southern reaches where it's much hotter and drier. Um, and we're really still relying on materials from much wetter, colder regions. And these seeds are not necessarily adapted to the Great Basin, especially as our climate continues to heat up and our precipitation becomes a lot less predictable. Um, so this, I, I think, is a problem for us. Um, and I have to say that, you know, where seed comes from matters a lot. You know, if you're on the geekier side like me, um, I really recommend reading this paper that we did a couple years ago, summarizing local adaptation experiments in the Great Basin. And it shows that across 327 experiments over the last 75 years, that's a long time, our native plants have shown that they are extremely locally adapted and they have genetics directly related to the environment where they're coming from. So to help visualize this, um, here is an example on the right using, uh, you know, where I washed roots from the same species. So both of these roots that are shown here are from Canactus deglassii, Douglas's dusty maiden, and they're both exactly 10 days old. But you can see they're showing completely different approaches to establishment and what they're doing in their first 10 years of life. Um, so that left picture is a plant from southeastern Oregon, and on the right side is from central Nevada. And you can see straight away that the Nevada plants put out an insane amount of roots right away compared to Oregon. Um, and they also stayed fairly small above ground, but those Oregon plants tended to focus more of their growth above ground, kind of getting bushier and taller, just they're competing for light. And this happened across seven species that I worked with um, and multiple, multiple populations. Um, so I think it's helpful to see this because if you imagine taking these plants from Oregon, trying to move them to central Nevada, you would find you know, they're not going to have the appropriate genetics and early life traits that it would take to survive here. Even though they look great when you're farming them or growing them in a greenhouse or a production setting, they just don't, they can't hack it when you get them out in the wild. Uh, so what do we do with this kind of information? You know, we can't necessarily collect all of our seeds um, extremely locally nearby. We still rely on purchasing large amounts of plant materials on the market. So what the, the solution we're coming up with and working towards is uh, BLM is looking to start shifting more towards seed zone based sourcing since it helps us capture these areas that are more similar to each other environmentally across the landscape. So I like to think of this as a slightly more complicated plant hardiness zone map that really takes precipitation patterns into account in addition to say temperature, um, since we can't irrigate our wildland sites. So that's essentially what these are. Um, and then we can start to develop plant materials by seed zones. And then the idea is to, we can move seed around within these regions with less worry about, you know, do we have the appropriate traits or adaptations and are we moving them too far? Um, so how does one go about developing more appropriate plant materials? Um, and how do we make sure they're coming from our seed zones of most interest? Well, we have to work through this entire 
uh, plant materials development cycle. And I'll tell you, it can take decades and it involves a lot of people working together to go from that initial seed collection all the way to getting project level amounts of seed that we can reliably use in restoration. So first for seed collection at the BLM, we have the Seeds of Success program that's really geared towards uh, collecting native seed across the nation um, for use in restoration, development, uh, conservation. So the seed is used for many different reasons um, and it's been running since 2001. And here in the Great Basin, we've done a, a great job and we currently have 5,872 collections in our active sort of seed bank that we can pull seeds from to use. And we've contributed um, since 2001, over 11,000 seed lots for long-term conservation in the Pullman and Fort Collins seed banks. Um, so the Great Basin has done a great job with this. And here's just a snapshot of where those currently available seeds are collected from, along with the plant populations that we're regularly scouting. And you can see that we have done, I think, a great job of blanketing the region. Um, in terms of points, we could still work on the diversity of these areas or the diversity of plants we're looking at, but I, I still am really happy with this. Um, and at this point, most of the blank spots on the map are non-BLM land, desert playas, or just really degraded sites, maybe that have burned, so they don't have a healthy source population. So we continue to add to this map every single year, and we're hoping for another great collection year um, after all this precip that we've gotten. Um, and these seed lots, as I mentioned, are not only important for conservation reasons, but all the extra seeds that we collect beyond sort of the minimum SOS standard, we can use those seeds for production and restoration purposes. Um, since we can never really collect enough seeds from the wild to be able to conduct the level of reseeding and restoration that's needed. Um, for instance, we might be over the moon to get a half pound collection from some of these species, but then for a reseeding project, we'll need, you know, hundreds or even thousands of pounds of seed. Um, so the way we do that is uh, agronomic seed production. And I have to say, I'm extremely grateful to all of our growers and seed vendors because they're really the key link in that development cycle to make all of our restoration efforts possible. So we can go all the way from, you know, these small wildland collections to having, you know, a fully stocked seed warehouse. It is, there's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, I do wanna add that although we rely heavily on agriculturally produced native seed for restoration, some of these um, managed seed production practices can conflict with restoration needs. Um, restoration bound seed has a really unique and complex job to perform. And this job is very different than that of typical agricultural um, crops. And it's very easy to inadvertently cause selection and domestication of certain native plant traits. Um, and that can hamper their ability to succeed in restoration settings. So I just wanna highlight this paper that we put out, I think it was two years ago now, um, and that discusses the research that's still needed. We still have a lot of questions in this area um, and how do we maintain ecological potential throughout the production cycle since we still need to work with producers. So I've been in my role now for about a year and I think I'm still new to many of you in the Great Basin. So I thought it might be helpful for me to talk about the vision for this program going forward. Um, and first and foremost, you know, what do we need to do? We need to increase our botanical and ecological capacity. Um, and I wanna say that we are working on getting several new positions um, classified and hired within the BLM. Um, for instance, we got approved and funded to hire a new state botanist for Nevada, which we have never had a position like that before. And we're also looking to hire restoration ecologists in each state office. Um, so keep an eye on USA Jobs and reach out to me if you want me to let you know when those get posted likely will still be a while. Um, we're also still transitioning towards conducting more proactive restoration planning and not just reacting after say a fire. Um, and I'm also prioritizing developing more diverse native plant materials for our region, just having more forbs to work with species that are native to our region. And I also plan to follow very closely the new National Academies report uh, recommendations. So, this new National Academies report um, came out last month. Yeah, it was March. 
uh, and it provides really the latest uh, information on our nation's native seed supply. I highly recommend checking out this document. And if you don't have the patience for the full, you know, 400 plus pages, they have some nice two page highlights um, that su summarizes everything pretty, pretty nicely. Um, and here are the top 10 recommendations. And I am today gonna walk you through uh, how we are working on each of those recommendations within the Great Basin as of now. And I just made these slides yesterday. So there's a lot of information that I haven't um, shared before because a lot has happened even in the last week. Um, so the first recommendation was to facilitate interagency coordination. And I'm really proud to say that at this Great Basin Regional level, we have not only been working with every BLM field and district office, but also have a really strong um, commitment to working in partnership with other federal agencies, nonprofit organizations, research groups, um, everybody. So here's just, a, and I know I'm missing a few folks. I'm sorry if, if I forgot your logo and you've worked with our program in the past, um, but here's just a snapshot of who we've worked with before. And these collaborations, you know, not only enhance uh, the BLM's program um, and our restoration efforts, but it also, we get to support the goals of all these multiple partner groups, which is really cool. Um, the BLM is a major funder in our region for a variety of projects. And that ranges from, you know, research grants to building programs and prisons to grow sagebrush seedlings, um, to funding seed cleaning and storage infrastructure. So we do a lot. Um, and if you ever are wondering, how do you get one of those BLM grants, go to grants.gov, keep an eye on it. Um, you can reach out to me if you want me to send you a link of an example. Um, and once a year we do uh, award grants to um, non-federal uh, partners, and then we can do uh, interagency agreements with federal partners. But um, the BLM often has uh, funding, but doesn't have necessarily the staff in-house to do things. So we really rely heavily on our partnerships with folks. Um, the second recommendation from NASM was to build regional programs and partnerships. And as I mentioned earlier, the Great Basin um, program was the first eco-regional effort identified at the BLM. And then Nevada was actually the first state to release a step-down strategy. And we also founded um, an early regional partnership, the Nevada Native Seed Partnership. And we were even called out as a nice example in the NASIM report to follow. So I'm, I'm really proud of this partnership. Um, thirdly, and this is brand new, uh, the, the NASIM report recommended promoting and expanding tribal nurseries. And an announcement came out from the DOI Secretary um, Holland last Friday confirming that uh, my program received funding to uh, initiate these two new projects. Um, that I propose to start this year. So the first is a conservation crew with the Mono Lake Kusadika'a tribe and to support a joint effort with the Paiute Indian tribe of Utah and the Forest Service to build a native plant nursery. So these are brand new and y'all are the first to hear me announce it publicly, but it's on our website, so they can't take it back now. So I'm excited to talk about it. Um, so more to come in the in the future about these, these works. Um, the fifth recommendation, was to conduct outreach with farmers and practitioners to promote tools and the latest information that we have on producing and working with native plants. So this is where partnerships have been really critical for us since our partners have a greater ability to connect with farmers and vendors. Um, so for instance, in Nevada, my program has been funding the Nevada Department of Agriculture to host a Nevada Native Seed Forum um, since you know the first one was in 2017. And we just had our seventh meeting two weeks ago, and it's, it's a really great place for us to connect with farmers and ranchers directly in the region. And many of the folks um, that attend these meetings are starting to try and find ways to embed native plants into their operations, since these species are much more water efficient. And they can also sell, at least right now, for relatively high prices, especially compared to, say, alfalfa. Um, we also have started to put together and fund uh, several public facing websites for information sharing and tools. Um, so you can check out our website at the Great Basin Native Plant Project. Uh, Corey's gonna talk later about Western Forbes Manual. We helped pay for that project um, and many more that I can't talk about all today, but um, we also uh, attend many conferences, conduct site visits and host webinars. So we, we do a lot of outreach. Um, additionally, I wanna add that I am also the secretary on the board for the International Network uh, for seed-based restoration, 
And that's sort of a sister chapter to this one. And I want to promote our new documentary that's coming out, um, the BLM funded INSR to uh, create um, a documentary called Native Seeds. And it premiered, the first cut premiered at the National Native Seeds Conference at the end of March. Um, but the final version, the final, for, for, you know, ready for public con consumption will start to be released um, on INSR social media starting in late June. Um, so follow us on social media. And, uh, you know, I would love it if you, we got more members to join and then you get our newsletter so you won't miss anything. Um, so that's a quick plug for INSR. Uh, so the sixth recommendation from the NASM report uh, was to expand research and development to improve the use of native seeds. And this is one area where we really excel in the Great Basin. So my program has funded and will continue to fund a ton of R&D projects geared at native plants. You know, we could have an entire conference dedicated just to the work we funded for research. Um, and it's partially summarized on the Great Basin Native Plant Project website. So feel free to peruse, you know, the over 200 manuscripts that we've um, produced over the years. And, you know, I've, my programs funded everything from project building seed zones to tracking genetics through seed production and even testing out different seed mixes just as a little sampling. Um, also, as part of the DOI announcement last Friday, I can say now that we received funding for our new partnership, uh, seeding evaluation and experimental design strategy. Um, and that is seeking to install research plots as part of um, major ESNR uh, recovery plans in the Great Basin to kind of help us systematically compare and assess treatment types post fire. Um, so, for instance, we plan to trial different seed mixes, herbicide strategies, you know, test different timing effects, lots of things. So, still in the development phase, more to come on this, but I can at least say it was funded, which is exciting. Um, Seventh, the, the NASM report recommended building more cooperative storage and cleaning infrastructure. And this is another area where we heavily rely on our partners. So the BLM at our headquarters helps fund the Bend Seed Extractory um, with the Forest Service. Uh, and they clean and store the majority of our seeds. But my program also helps fund the University of Nevada Reno's Native Seed Bank, which is pictured on the bottom here. And they're able to clean smaller lots of seed for all clientele, not just federal folks. Um, so that's a great resource for our region, and they can also store um, some very small amounts of seed for the long term, and hopefully we can help them build their capacity there. Also in the past, we have helped fund the Great Basin Research Center over in Ephraim um, to help clean and procure seeds, and also currently we have an agreement with um, the Department of Agriculture in Nevada to build our first foundational seed program, and it is the only foundational seed program right now in the country that is really dedicated to only native plants. Um, typically they're crop species with a few natives mixed in, but ours is solely dedicated to native plants. And it just started, I think last year officially, and they started uh, accepting applications twice a year from our Nevada growers um, interested in receiving free native seeds to grow on their operation. So this top picture um, is the very first recipient of our seeds planting them in the field in the winter. So a lot went into getting these seeds in the ground on somebody's farm. Um, the eighth recommendation was to expand the BLM's national seed warehouse system, which is already underway. Our warehouses, I have to say, have struggled with staffing um, since at least 2020, maybe even before then. And I'm happy to say that we're, uh, they are hiring a lot of new folks. Um, and we even got a new warehouse manager for our Ely location who started, I think on Monday of this week, um, so that facility is going to be able to run uh, really smoothly again and kind of run at full capacity, which is awesome. Um, also, the fourth recommendation from NASM was to increase our predictability in purchases uh, and try and help settle the really volatile market. So the main thing we can do to address that is to conduct more proactive planning, which, as I mentioned before, is a new approach for much of the BOM. Um, and we're really working to hire more restoration ecologists to help make this possible since we are still struggling with capacity to do this. Um, we also plan to continue contracting for seed purchases before production. So that if you've ever heard of our indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity um, seed production contracting, that allows us, uh, the BLM, to share risk with growers um, and help offset some of their costs. Um, so since 2018 in the Great Basin, we've sent over 200 pounds of seed 
from 100 populations um, to growers via these contracts. We've also partnered with local nonprofits to convert old alfalfa farms to growing diverse native species. We've also been working to improve our seed collection permitting process, and we have a new database to help with that effort, although I have to say it's still difficult. Um, and we've also funded the Nature Conservancy to complete a seed needs forecast for um, the Carson City District, just as a, a single proof of concept, um, since if we can really dial in our seed forecasting, it can help us plan for our purchasing, storage, and budgeting needs. Um, so I think seed forecasting is still, we have a lot to kind of work on there to get it really nice and um, dialed in. So the last two recommendations for NASM were to include BLM ecologists and restoration planning. Again, that's related to our capacity issues and we're working on hiring more folks to make this a reality. Um, and lastly, to identify and conserve seed reservoirs. And I think it was about two days after that NASM report came out, um, the Ecoregional Program Coordinators started working with the National Operations Center at the BLM to start initiating this process to identify um, what we're calling living seed bank management areas. Um, also, at the end of March, there was a new um, public lands rule for the BLM announced, and it's currently open for public comment. And uh, it, this rule, if passed as it's currently written, would define conservation as a use on public on BLM lands, similar to how grazing, recreation, and mining are uses. Um, so it would allow for conservation leases, uh, similar to like a grazing lease. But we still aren't sure uh, what that will actually entail in practice, since it is so new and still sort of in this um, firming up period. So with that, I want to end my talk by reminding all of us that restoration is not a substitute for conservation. You know, our best course is always going to be to reduce our need for plant materials in the first place. So that means trying to salvage established plants and their soils or protecting intact resources that we still have on the ground. Since some of these areas we could never re fully recover from our own actions alone. So we should never really use restoration as a way of justifying unsustainable use of our resources, um, especially since we may not be able to ever reestablish the full assemblage of native species once they get removed from a landscape. Um, so I hope I got you excited about native seeds and what's happening you know, right now at the BLM. And I hope we have some time for questions or you can feel free to email me uh, later. Great. Thank you, Allison. That was, I'm really excited to hear you've only been there a year. You, there's an awful lot of things happening here and that's, yeah. that's pretty amazing. Um, we do have uh, almost 10 minutes for questions. So okay. again, a reminder of if you, the best place to do that is through the Q&A function um, rather than through the, the chat, because, you know, then we can use the chat to, to chat. Uh, so while you're thinking of those, um, Allison, <laughs> help me. So, are, you know, we talk about the Great Basin as if it's one big thing, but it's not. You know, we, mm -hmm. have, you know, you you mentioned the North, you know, the sort of Central Great Basin versus the Northern Great Basin, and some of the different climatic conditions you know, the, the different soils in the Snake River Plain than there are elsewhere. Um, are there places that we really need, you know, certain kinds of um, environmental conditions that we might need to focus on more than some others just because of where we've been able to work so far? Yeah, so there have been a lot of efforts to say, identify focal areas, for instance, um, for restoration. So that's sort of, you know, we can't necessarily restore all of the degraded habitat all in one fell swoop across the Great Basin on public lands. So we need to identify, okay, what are the areas we care about the most and we have the greatest chance for success? And then let's focus on sort of how do we be extremely successful in those areas and then sort of move out from there. Um, and a lot of that gets determined by, uh, you know, how intact the areas are. So, uh, for instance, there are, um, really nice priority areas for sage grouse in 
northeastern Nevada, and those are regions where they've burned maybe just once. So there's still a really nice seed bank intact, so they still have some resiliency there. So maybe all they need is some help uh, suppressing invasive. So then that's the approach we go in with restoration. But then other areas, they're completely, you know, they decimated and there's no seed bank. It's just all cheatgrass. Then maybe we need to kind of focus more on that remediation, rehabilitation sort of efforts um, and try to find plant materials that are suitable for just, you know, stabilizing soil and fighting out cheatgrass. I don't know if this is quite answering your question, but it's a really complicated problem and we need um, to have methods and the right equipment and materials and approaches for each of these different areas. So you can't ever just make like huge sweeping generalities, but it is all sort of specific to regions. So all of these restoration efforts, even though I'm talking about them at the regional level, it all is still going to come down to these districts and field offices who know their sort of local, um, you know, what the soils are, the climate, the history, all of that, and they can still tailor every project to sort of what's happening locally. Um, so it's hard to make like sort of generalized statements, um, but it varies a lot in approaches, uh, appropriate plant materials, the timing of everything um, as you move from the northern Great Basin all the way to the southern end. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, we have a question from David Richards, who is uh, aquatic restoration um, person. So he he's comes from a little different angle than, than a lot of us. And he wants to ask, are you interested in reestablishing native Phragmites? Um, Phragmites, like yeah. Or anything like that? Yeah, so I know that folks have worked on that, I believe in Utah. And I have not been a part of those efforts at all. And I don't know that it has been I haven't seen it like in our seed warehouse. Um, I would think riparian and wet meadow restoration is something that we need to do more of, honestly. And we've focused more on uh, suppressing native or invasive species in these areas rather than proactively trying to reestablish new things. But um, personally, I'd love to see us doing more work with all of our uh, riparian species. Um, but I, I can't think of a, a specific example off the top of my head where the BLM is doing that. Great. Maybe someone on this call knows, but I don't know. <laughs> Other questions for Allison? I guess I could have talked longer, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. I have a question here from Eric Winford. Do you see an opportunity to expand the partnerships you've already built? And in particular, perhaps a role for the general public to become involved, perhaps through proactive restoration? I do. I do think that we could expand these partnerships more and also try to get the public more involved. I think that um, getting the public involved is definitely more something we can do through partner agencies. So for instance, um, we had an agreement with the Friends of Nevada Wilderness where they were able to, um, we were able to tap into their volunteer network to do seed collection. Um, so we did that for a couple of years. Unfortunately, we started that project in 2020, so it didn't go quite the way we had planned, which is, you know, the way life works. Um, but I do think that there is hope there and that I would like to see more of that. We also have that Sagebrush and Prisons project um, that is uh, sort of funded by the BLM, but run by the Institute for Applied Ecology. And they're working with incarcerated folks to um, get certifications for growing, they're sort of horticultural certifications for growing sagebrush. And then they also um, go out and plant on the ground. But I do think that there's room for bigger partnerships um, to include more of the public, because I think, um, that's something that's hard to do, especially the BLM doesn't have capacity, but if we found the right partners who already had established volunteer networks, that would be a really nice um, puzzle piece to kind of add in. Thanks, Eric. Great. Um, <clears throat> we do have time for another question or two, depending on how complicated they are. I just explained it all too well, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> there was a there was there was a lot, and um, <clears throat> I was surprised to see how much 
interest the National Academy had in this region, because a lot of times we feel like we're the forgotten part of America. Yeah. It helps that the BLM uh, sponsored the report. (laughs) (laughs) Great. Um, I don't want to, oh yes, okay, here's one from the chat. It says, do you have any advice for staff who want to learn how to collect native seeds? Yes, yeah, so there are some great resources. Um, anyone can attend. Uh, now that, you know, one benefit of, you know, COVID is that we started doing more online and virtual webinars, so there's a lot of um uh, it's like the there's a national seeds of success training. There's one actually happening this week, um, and those are now open to everybody. So you can email me if you want me to put you in touch with our national coordinator for those trainings. Um, there's also a uh, the Great Basin. I think the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange has some videos on seed collecting in their YouTube. Um, you can check out our Great Basin Native Plant Project website. We're trying to put more resources there. Also, if you just Google the seeds of success um, for the BLM, they have a manual that kind of walks you through the best management practices. But I still would really recommend attending a, a seeds of success training because even if you're not conducting, you know, seeds of success, it's still sort of the best practices for um, taking a seed collection. So even if you're not officially in our database and do all of that, it's still a good approach to seed collection generally. Um, We're also actually hosting, oh, I can invite you to this. On Friday, we have a supplemental session to the National SOS Training for Great Basin. So if you want to get invited to that, um, just shoot me an email and I'll be happy to send you a link for, um, you know, seed collection specific to the Great Basin. That's happening this Friday, but we're also recording it so we can share share that with folks after the fact. Um, But yeah, there's a lot of great resources online, but I still think, you know, a good old fashioned training is also helpful. True. Um, Just a follow up here from Stephanie Graham to uh, the question earlier about uh, riparian and and seed planting. BLM in Northern Utah doesn't do as much riparian seed planting, though they do work with SOS, but they're they're seeds of success, but there's effort happening on willow plantings and overall riparian restoration. A lot of that happening right now. just not as much on BLM land. And then yep. just real quick, I don't know if you know this, just one one last question is, where did the name Toe Jam come from? I don't know, but um, my old advisor, Beth Ledger, likes to say like, Nevada always gets the worst place names for everything. So <laughs> like, I don't know why Nevada got the worst name that we did. Okay. I have no idea where that came from. Does someone on the call know? Pop it in the chat. Okay. Yeah. Um, great. Well, thanks, Allison. And um, I'm. It is a creek. That's what oh, I thought. Okay. I thought it was. Yeah. Why they named the creek that? I have um, no idea. No idea. Um, well, great. Thank you very much. And I'd like to now um, introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Lawrence Fakar. Um, when, when we, um, you know, we heard a number of different challenges that Allison mentioned. Uh, for a lot of us, the big one that looms for us is um, dealing with a climate and, a, and the kind of climatic extremes that we haven't dealt with before. And so Lauren, who is with the uh, uh, USDA Ag Research Service in Burns, will inter- tell us a little bit about what she's thinking on that topic. Oh, thanks for the introduction, Mark. I'll share screen really fast. Does that show up all right? You're still in um, in the, uh, there you go, perfect. Yeah, all right. Um, so I'm, my name is Lauren Sveker. I'm gonna be talking about restoring different ecosystems in the face of increasingly greater climatic extremes. So as many people on this call will know, uh, billions of dollars are spent annually on ecological restoration, and there are numerous commitments promising restoration of millions of hectares globally. And a lot of these are really focused on forest systems, unfortunately. There's you know, a, a bit of a, um, to the detriment of rangelands and dryland systems, we're kind of the forgotten lands. And that has to do with, one, we have lower populations. A lot of people consider it trash lands. And so 
there's not only a, a lot less funding that tends to go to these systems, but also just active participation. So with higher populations in forested systems, you maybe have more active efforts um, for restoring those systems. And we know that if you don't put money towards restoration of rangeland dryland systems, then autogenic recovery is really unlikely. Uh, Leslie Morris with UNR now has done some amazing research looking at in the Great Basin, old ag fields that were cleared in the early 1900s, and you can still see those lines. So without any active restoration, those lines are still apparent and those ecosystems haven't restored after almost 100 years. And so unfortunately for us, rangeland degradation can occur across hundreds of thousands of square kilometers. We know with the increases in mega fires, like this is becoming even more critical. Uh, and given the large scale of degradation and often limited amount of funding, uh, we require the use of seed-based restoration practices to return native species. And while restoration uh, is posited as a solution to climate change, unfortunately, we now have to restore in the midst of a rapidly changing climate. We're no longer at the point where we could say, climate change is going to happen. It's going to be there in the future. It's happening now. We're, we're experiencing more extremes in annual and interannual variation. And that's a major challenge for restoration. The most critical stage of plant establishment is between germination and emergence. And so if we're having greater extremes, then that's going to lead to higher risk for our increasingly limited seed resources. And so with the recent report from the International Panel on Climate Change with the AR6 report that just came out, uh, we can see that, you know, not only are there are a lot of changes just in general to our climate, in of particular interest to uh, ecologists and, and restoration practitioners are changes to our precipitation patterns and changes in our temperatures. And so Right. heavy precipitation pattern, as we've seen this year, uh, is likely to increase, but then we also have increases in extreme drought conditions. So if your seed isn't flooding away, then it's drying up and then your plants are dying. And then there's the risk of, of extreme heat wave events, like a 10-year heat wave is now three times more likely, and a 50-year heat wave event is, is five times more likely. So how we restore is going to become ever more imperative if we're wanting to establish our native species and then not add to the increasing risk of biodiversity loss globally. And this, you know, this is made very apparent in the U.S. example from 2021. Uh, we had ecological, oh, there was the, the heat dome that hit the Pacific Northwest. There were Mormon cricket and grasshopper outbreaks because of a dry spring. There were record-setting wildfires. There was flooding in Arizona. I was intimately familiar with all of these events because I had projects across six Western states. And of all of the plants that I put out, zero plants established. And that's just on a research scale. So 2021 was detrimental for me. It was even more detrimental for land managers who had had restoration projects that they put out. Because ultimately, if you spent a million dollars on seed and put it out into the field, you got zero in return, which is really, really not only harmful from a financial perspective, but ecologically as well. And so, as I mentioned, like this isn't just happening here in the Western US, this is happening all over the world. And so a collaborator and I in Western Australia were talking about what are we doing and, and how do we improve our chances of restoring species within this changing climate. And so we talked about the need for an adaptive bet hedging approach to restoration. We talked about there being four critical steps. And the first is determining the likelihood of extreme climatic events and associated disturbances occurring, using the risk data to inform spatial temporal implementation of restoration projects, utilizing and applying multiple treatments, and then monitoring and assessing restoration projects through time. Now, determining the risk, as I mentioned, there are not only forecasts, but historic data that we can draw upon to look and see, like, what are the frequencies and possible risks of droughts or heat waves that'll stress plants and then lead to mortality? And then are there associated risks? For example, if you have a dry spring, what's the likelihood of having a pest plague outbreak? Or if you've got high production in, in one year and then a dry year the next, are you going to have a higher risk of wildfire? And so at the moment, what a lot of restoration practitioners in the Western US and Australia do is following a disturbance event, all of your seed will probably go into one year. Um, it's expensive to implement things. So 
if you put all of your seed in year one, let's say you have 12 pounds per acre, you put it in year one and then a drought hits. And maybe you're lucky and a few individuals survive, but then the next year, maybe you have a heat wave event. And so then you end up with no individuals. And so if you think about altering the timing, if we take that total amount of seed, you're still spending money on 12 pounds of seed, but you put four pounds in year one, four pounds in year two, four pounds in year three, can you essentially spread your risk, right? You can think of this in terms of, of investing. Like if you were investing in the stock market, if you put all your money in one stock, that's a high risk scenario. And if you utilize a portfolio approach wherein you put your, invest your money in multiple stocks, your odds of having increases in gains is higher. Now, thinking about this in terms of a precision restoration framework approach, you know, can you identify specific abiotic and biotic barriers to seedling establishment and then utilize your knowledge of those abiotic and biotic barriers to then develop seed enhancement technologies that might help to overcome or alleviate those barriers? So, for example, we know post wildfire, we end up having really hydrophobic soils. And so can you use something like a surfactant coating uh, as has been developed by the Madsen lab? and then use that as a way to help with water infiltration. And so then building on your proposed alteration and timeline, can you then incorporate those changes to uh, your seed materials? So for example, in restoration scenario three, can you have um, surfactant coated seed, maybe one pound of bare seed, three pounds of surfactant coated seed in the first year following a wildfire. And then we know in the Great Basin that following wildfires, you have a high risk of invasion of exotic annual grasses. So then maybe in the second year, you use something like carbon pods, where you have herbicide application and seed. Uh, and then with the ultimate goal of being, can we get more individuals to establish so that one, people don't have to say, hey, non-native species are what we have to use because they establish. Can we improve our ability to establish not just non-natives, but also native species. So we have the ultimate ability to not only conserve species, but we're really focusing on saving the soil. Because if we don't save our soil, we're, we're really screwed. And then monitoring, assessing. We all talk about it, but it's needed, we need to do it, but a lot of land management agencies and practitioners are limited in their funding. People are overextended. You talk to any BLM area office and people have tons of work to do. They're busy writing proposals, getting out into the field and actually monitoring can be really, really challenging, um, but it is necessary. And even as you know, a restoration researcher, most of the restoration work that we do, we look at one, two, three years post project implementation, is that enough? Is that enough for us to say that it's been successful? And so really considering how are we, how are we looking at our restoration from a long-term perspective? Because it's not gonna happen quickly. So now I'll walk through just the example from the sagebrush step restoration. As I mentioned, one of the major challenges within sagebrush step restoration is that we have the invasion of exotic annual grasses, specifically cheatgrass and medusa head. And so as you have an increase in exotic annual grasses, then you have a change in, in fire cycles, and then it leads to this really detrimental positive feedback loop, wherein you end up with a monoculture of exotic annual grasses, which, as I mentioned, detrimental to your soils. You have a monoculture of annual species. You have high risk of soil erosion. You have a loss of endangered species like you know, upcoming with the, the sage grouse. And so how do we stop that cycle? Um, it's really critical for the conservation of many species within our system that we restore our native species and, and maintain the habitat and save the core of the sagebrush steppe. Now we know from research that the success of restoration means the establishment of native species is variable through both space and time. Um, Kirk Davies had done a, a study looking at bare seed versus a seed enhancement technology with pillows using carbon in an in a exotic annual grass invaded system. And between years across elevations, you had high variability in seed establishment. And uh, another project that we we're looking comparing broadcast seeding versus drill seeding, same thing huge climodaphic variability. And so when we start talking about restoring across really large landscape scales, uh, you're starting to talk about huge heterogeneity in the context of what you're restoring in. And so not only do we have the climatic variability, but also the adaphic variability through space. 
case. And so as we're walking through our sagebrush step example, of, you know, using our four step plan, when how do we determine the risk? So looking at historic data, we know that in a 10 year period, there's a 30% chance of drought occurring. And we know in predictions that there's a 30% chance of a 10 year heat wave event occurring. So we might say that, you know, if you look for three years, uh, that, that would be a good time frame within which to do consecutive seeding projects. And so then the, the limitation to that, of course, is the cost of seed would possibly be the same, but the implementation costs would be higher. And then applying multiple trees. So drill seeding is not possible in all areas, but can you drill seed where drill seeding is possible and then broadcast seed in multiple years? Or can we develop seed enhancement technologies that would help and give the benefit of drill seeding, but with the reduced cost and the greater uh, logistical extent of aerial seeding, and then also uh, incorporating efforts like carbon pods so you can simultaneously control for your exotic annual grasses and get the establishment of your native species. And then, as I mentioned, monitoring and assessing, did this work in year one? Um, if, it, if we had zero establishment, then what do we do in year two? If we've got uh, increased uh, expansion of exotic annual grasses, do we need to control for that or keep seeding? And so the next steps for us with the research that we're doing, um, uh, collaborators and I are working on using climate data and forecasts to model with existing data that we have, how can we look across what those risks are going to be. Um, there have been within heat wave studies in particular, we know that drought kills seedlings, we know that um, really hot summers are probably going to be bad for seedlings. And, and just to define a heat wave, it's not increasing temperature as in every day is a little bit warmer. Unfortunately, the increases in temperature being driven by climatic extremes of heat waves, wherein you've got five to 10 degrees Celsius above your average for a three to seven day period. Of course, definitions vary, but that means that you're getting this massive shock. Right. So as an individual, you know, think about yourself as we're going from a cold winter and into now a cold spring. If we get one 80 degree day, we're all going to be feeling it. Right. Because it's been 50 degree Fahrenheit for us for the last you know, week or two. If we hit 80 over the weekend, it's going to feel pretty warm. And that's the same for plants. If you have these real shocks, it can be a shock to the system. But for a lot of rangeland species, we're not entirely sure what the level is for a mortality event. So really digging deeper into what the climate data says on those smaller timeframes. Um, and then using the risk data. So we currently are working on grant efforts to impose multi-year seedings across the Western US. That's not just the Great Basin, but also California annual grasslands and the Sonoran Desert. Um, if we see multiple years in the plot, is there a benefit? And can we start incorporating economic analyses into that to look and see like what logistically are possibilities for land managers? And then applying multiple treatments, we're also working on diversifying not only our planting treatments, but also seed enhancement technologies that might alleviate drought and heat stress. Uh, one of the things that I've been interested in that I'm working on is the use of salicylic acid because like for humans where you take an aspirin for your headache, um, if you give salicylic acid, which is aspirin, to plants, it can also help to alleviate stress. And this has been found in a lot of agricultural literature, but only one paper so far has been presented, um, or one project on native species, uh, and that was in Western Australia, and it had showed, shown a benefit. And then assessing and monitoring, we, we want to really look and see surveying land managers. I work with the diversity of land managers, but it's really good to know who it is that, what are the challenges that people are coming across? What are the different groups that are conducting restoration? How can we help them? What are the limitations that they come across? And as I mentioned, economic analyses for these various approaches and methods, it's, it's one thing to do this work within a research perspective, but if it can't be applied, then what's the point? Um, it's a bit of a waste of time, really. So if we, if we can't come up with an option that's viable for our land managers, then we really need to be evaluating what we're doing with our time. time. And you know, how do we get, get there? And that's really considering possibly novel business structures, right? We know they're one of the reasons that a lot of people seed in a single year is logistical limitations. You have government agencies that are limited in getting lump sums of money following a disturbance event like a wildfire, wherein if you don't spend your money in that year, you're not going to get it the next year to prepare for your fire season. Or private land managers this year, our, our local ranchers lost almost 50% of their caps. They're not going to have the money or resources 
to do anything in the next couple of years because of that loss. So are there ways that we can work with those groups for those different limitations? And can we develop business, business structures um, that would help to alleviate some of those challenges? And so I've been very fortunate. I get to work with a really wide variety of people. Um, this is a, a short list of people who are explicitly I'm working with for the projects that I mentioned. Um, but I would really uh, love to talk with more people about efforts that they're working on and collaborate with people if they're they're interested in collaborating. And that's my talk. Great. Thanks very much, Lauren. Um, I think, yeah, what we heard was, you know, things that a lot of us have been thinking about, but you put them into a really nice sort of, you know, succinct and orderly kind of way to, you know, help people think through this. Again, we do have a couple minutes for questions uh, and I don't see any right now, but there was a comment in the chat. Um, that salicylic acid is also allelopathic. Have you any information about that? No, I, what, um, I'm not sure what context David's talking about. Alila. Well, how it, oh, well, let me ask them, you know, how would, how would you use that then? Is it, is it an application to the, to the site or? Actually to the individual seed. So, oh, okay. yeah. so you can use it as a seed coating or you can do imbibing. So that's where I personally am a big fan of it. And I want to do more research on it. I have, ironically, you know, I, I have 10 years of drought and then I installed drought studies last fall and this year is the <laughs> wettest year on record. So <laughs> that's, that's been my luck the last couple of years with field projects. But <laughs> um, so if anyone wants a drought project installed in their area, it's better than a rain dance, I got to say. <laughs> Okay. Um, but so um, what I've been doing is imbibing seeds with salicylic acid. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a, and I've been using like 0.1 micromoles in general, um, and I'm testing a range with uh, Tom Monaco at uh, USDA ARS in, in Logan and with the groups in California. And it's something that land managers could do themselves. So it's pretty easy treatment. You literally soak the seed for 24 hours uh, in, in the, the solution and then you dry it back down and then you can seed it just as you would anything else or what we're looking at is also possibly incorporating treated seed into carbon pods so you can simultaneously then apply a treatment for uh, control of you know you put your herbicide pods out so herbicide protection pods out so then you can spray herbicide over the top so then you've got one the protection from the herbicide and then if the seed is already treated with salicylic acid can it possibly help with drought or uh, heat stress events Okay. Now I've got a question here from Beth Ledger that um, she says, any thoughts on transplanting and watering? She points, she suggests that it may be better to have some expensive plants than zero seedlings. Yeah. I mean, I agree with that. And it, it just depends on the context, right? And this is the challenge for rangeland systems globally. You have a lower population, you've got fewer people in greater areas to do a lot of work. So or you know, using some of Beth's work and looking at, can you do these micro nodes of establishing smaller areas um, and making sure that you've done a good job establishing them? I think it's a great idea. And we talked with land managers in New Mexico about you know, why spray tebetheron to control, control grasses when you could dump water instead and get your grass. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, well, we've, we've come to our break, our first break, um, so I've this set up, it's, uh, says it's 11, 1046 or 946, depending on which time zone you're in. Uh, and we'll convene again at 10 o'clock Pacific, 11 o'clock, uh, mountain. And we'll have three talks, three more 20 minute talks. Uh, two of which have to do with um, seed enhancement technology. So, so Lauren Stock was a, a great way to introduce that. So thanks everyone for your attention so far and, uh, and we'll see you all in fairly shortly, but it, at, at, on the top of the hour. Hmm. 
Okay, well, I would like to welcome everyone back to uh, the 2023 annual meeting of the Great Basin Chapter of the Society for Ecological Restoration. We have three talks over the next hour um, <clears throat> before our chapter business meeting. I do wanna remind people before I start that if you have questions, please, you can use the Q&A function um, in the, in, uh, that Zoom has. And there's no reason to wait until after the talk to type in your questions um, so that you, know, you can get a jump on and, and make sure that, um, <clears throat> that you have a chance to get your question answered. So with that, I'd like to welcome Allison Simler Williamson um, to join us. She uh, will, is on the faculty at Boise State University and she'll be sharing some of the work she's been doing, looking at how soil microbial communities contribute to the establishment of big sagebrush. Excellent, thank you so much for having me and um, thanks for the talk so far. Um, I am gonna talk a little bit today about the role that local adaptation to species interactions might play in the establishment of big sagebrush. And so before I dive in, I just wanna say thank you to, there's a really large team of people who have helped collect the data and develop the experiments um, that I'm about to present, as well as a variety of um, people who dropped in on us in the field and uh, resource managers who helped facilitate collection and things like that. So. So um, the last few talks have really uh, made it clear the extent to which we are investing in widespread restoration seedings across the Great Basin. Um, big sagebrush is one of those targets of um, these seeding efforts. But, sorry, I'm getting like a feedback from somebody. Can't quite hear. Okay. Um, the um, and so these. Uh, these uh, seeding efforts, when we are selecting seeds for these seeding efforts, we're often thinking a lot about local adaptation to the site where we're restoring. A lot of that information about local adaptation is really shaped by the climate characteristics and the site characteristics um, of, of the places that we're restoring. However, there's a lot of evidence that biotic interactions can contribute strongly to local adaptation in populations. Um, pathogens, symbionts, herbivores, and um, uh, within taxa sorts of uh, competitors can have really strong spatial signatures that can generate consistent selection on populations. However, when we do studies of local adaptation, typically uh, single studies don't tend to parse the drivers of local adaptation at a particular site, making it really hard to understand how much of local adaptation signature is actually climate versus abi other abiotic factors versus things that might actually be biotic interactions that are correlated with um, the characteristics of a particular site. And this is really important because as climate changes and as other anthropogenic uh, uh, kind of stressors increase, uh, we shouldn't expect species interactions to be shifting in the same ways that climate or these other sorts of abiotic shifts might be occurring, meaning that those sources of adaptation might actually be disrupted in ways that we can't predict from climate alone. And so we're really interested in how biotic local adaptation influences the predictions of where populations can establish and how those predictions differ to those based just on thinking about things like climate or abiotic factors. But specifically, we're looking at these questions in big sagebrush, which is a widely translocated species, um, a target of restoration interests um, because of the fact that, um, as previous talks have indicated, um, invasive um, annual grasses have altered the fire cycle in the Great Basin. Climate is another antagonist here. And so um, there are many, many places where following fires in the Great Basin, people are trying to get sagebrush seeds back out on the landscape. And so we're curious whether um, species interactions and specifically interactions between soil microbial communities and sagebrush populations shape restoration outcomes when we do these widespread translocations of seeds. And so we've been developing a series of different common gardens because we're working with soil microbial communities. Um, common garden designs require some modifications because we're trying to transplant seeds into different microbial communities to assess the extent to which sagebrush populations are locally adapted. And so we have a combination of field-based and greenhouse-based common garden designs that are targeting different vital rates of sagebrush. And so far we've been mostly working on vital rates across that first year of development. Um, as sort of a relevant um, 
criteria for what we would think of as restoration success. And so sagebrush seeds typically develop in the fall um, and then overwinter at the soil surface or on the snow and then germinate the following spring during a period of snow melts, um, high soil moisture content, and then sagebrush seedlings experience um, more drought as the season goes on. And so we've designed our experiments around these different life history stages. We've collected seeds and soils um, from four different sagebrush sites representing a gradient of climatic characteristics, but also soil um, biogeochemical characteristics. And <clears throat> have um, conducted these experimental designs where we are translocating seeds into different combinations of either sterilized soil or sterilized soil containing a uh, live soil inoculum. We're calculating the translocation distances for seeds relative to those soil characteristics using a suite of characteristics. Um, and so this is what one of those field-based common garden designs looks like. We have these PVC kind of containers that you can see here that have these mesh membrane cylinder um, bottoms that allow solutes to enter the cylinder but exclude fungi and bacteria, keeping those inoculum um, relatively distinct, even though we're in field conditions. Um, this is an example of a design where we were trying to understand the role that soil microbial communities play in the overwinter survival of those seeds that are hanging out at the seed surface. Um, and so we put out these germination bags containing seeds and let them incubate in these soil microbial communities um, during the winter and then assessed what impacts the soil microbial communities had on the seeds by testing seed viability and counting the seeds that had actually germinated as we were collecting um, back in the um, lab on petri dishes. And so what we found was generally that you can see here this gray line is the sterilized soil uh, replicates in our experiment. The green line is the um, replicates that received the um, microbial inoculum that was still alive. And what you can see here is that there's clear negative impacts of soil microbial communities on these overwintering seeds, but that the strength of that interaction varies depending on the seed to soil environmental translocation distance, which is a function of pH, temperature, precipitation, nitrogen, and a couple other characteristics that we use to characterize the sites that we collected these soils from. And so this blue line is kind of the net difference, the interaction term in that relationship. And so you can see that there are overall negative impacts of soil microbes on those overwintering seeds, um, but that those negative impacts become increasingly negative as we move farther and farther away in terms of where that seed is planted relative to the soil microbial community's origin. And so that's just one vital rate example, but we've been doing similar experimental designs to try to target other vital rates across this first year of sagebrush's development. Um, so we have a series of different greenhouse experiments running. Um, this is um, the effect of the so that same sort of interaction term from an experiment looking at the effect of the soil microbial community on the probability that new germinants are surviving in the greenhouse um, under a fixed watering and temperature regime. And so what you can see here is that we still have this signature that is consistent with local adaptation where we have generally positive effects of microbes on those new germinants, but that positive effect decreases and even switches over to become quite strongly negative as we are introducing seeds to more foreign or more different um, soil microbial communities compared to where they came from. Similarly, as we watch seedlings proceed through the, um, through the summer, those microbial impacts become generally more positive as the seedlings age consistent with relationships with symbiotic um, sorts of soil organisms. Um, but Overall, we still see the signature of local adaptation across another separate vital rate. We also see positive effects generally of microbial communities on growth as those seedlings age, assuming that they actually survive. And, um, and even though it's a weaker effect, we do see a decline in that um, effect of on growth as translocation um, distance increases. We also see variation in the strength of those effects depending on where soils came from within our sites. So we collected some soils beneath sagebrush shrubs, and then we collected others in these inner space areas between sagebrush shrubs. Um, and so these are the effects that I just showed on the previous slide where these were collected underneath intact parent individuals. But when we switch over to those interspace inoculum, which are the gaps in between sagebrush shrubs, you can see that the effects of microbes are more consistent across translocation distances and generally a little bit more negative. 
suggesting that um, parrot sagebrush and soil conditioning might play a role um, and stand level density might play a role in how strong these impacts actually are on the ground. And so we've seen sagebrush exhibit these signals that are consistent with local adaptation to soil microbial communities um, and their interactions across these different early life history stages. But each of these is only a single vital rate or a single um, kind of uh, life history process. Um, and the important question here for us is whether this actually scales up to impact population dynamics, because that's not only the stuff that we care about in a restoration context, that's also what actually might result in adaptation of these populations. And so to assess this, we've combined all of these different vital rates. Um, the, each of these experiments has been designed to kind of go together. They represent a consistent set of climatic conditions. Um, and we're using each of these vital rates to develop integral projection models of sagebrush populations across that first year of development. And so each of these um, experiments represents a different stage, a different set of um, uh, uh, parameters that we can use in this model. And so this is an example of what that might look like. We can simulate seeding for a you know, fixed number of seeds that we add to a particular um, site or theoretical population. And then the populations experience stochastic draws from the estimated um, uh, vital rates across this kind of population cycle for the, the first year of development. You can see here, this is uh, for seeds planted into their home si soils. So the translocation distance is zero when they receive an inoculum or when they don't receive an inoculum compared to if they receive an inoculum. And so if we look at the average pattern across um, uh, all those stochastic draws and the differences that we see associated with soil microbes, this dashed line here represents where soil microbial communities are are having no effect. So the, the, the pots or the experimental units that received inoculum have the same response as those that did not receive it. And what you can see here for the seeds that have been planted into their home soils is that the effect of soil microbes on the population size overall compared to those sterile controls is generally negative at the beginning of the experiment, but that as the population kind of proceeds through that first year, there are generally positive impacts, impacts of soil microbes. Um, at a, you know, uh, if a population is planted into their home soil or a soil that's similar to the sorts of characteristics that they came from. However, as translocation increases, this is the mean translocation distance that we used across our entire experiment, you can see that the negative effects of microbes persist and that overall there is a negative impact of microbial communities on the overall population size at the end of our set of simulations. And if we look at, oh, and if you, we've conducted sen sensitivity analysis um, uh, for these population models and population size at the end of that first year is most sensitive to changes in the viability of seeds after overwintering and the survival of new seedlings. So those very early and mostly kind of negative microbial impacts are having really large impacts on the, um, the resulting population size at the end of the model run. If we look at this across a variety of different translocation distances, the take home message here is that our home soil microbial communities have these stronger positive impacts on safe brush establishment, the, the kind of end population size at the end of that first year, than microbes from more environmentally distant sites. As you can see here, that, that impact of microbial communities starts to switch into the negative space as that translocation distance increases. And so we've um, sequenced um, uh, uh, the fungal and bacterial communities from all of the experimental inocula that we've used in these um, experiments. And so we're currently trying to identify pathogens and mutualists that have the strongest correlations with those first year establishment outcomes, as well as those that exhibit the most variation in their impacts across the different populations that we used. Um, the, the goal here, I think, is to use this sort of correlative data where we've applied an entire microbial community to hone in on um, whether there are specific pathogens or symbionts that really matter um, for sagebrush's early development and whether there are certain that exhibit um, stronger spatial signatures um, to sites versus being more widely ubiquitous. And so overall, we find evidence that these translocation distances can influence the strength of microbial impacts on sagebrush during its first year of development. It's hard to talk about local adaptation in a really long lived species like sagebrush, but this is evidence that's consistent with biotic local adaptation. Um, 
These strong pathogenic impacts on overwintering seeds and early germinants are particularly interesting to us because a lot of the microbial um, ecology literature focused on sagebrush has focused on symbionts, um, and so we're really interested in exploring that further. However, there are po clear positive interactions as um, these sagebrush seedlings age. The species interactions appear to be strong enough to shape outcomes of restoration translocations at the single year time scale. However, I think we all know that that this, the first year following a restoration effort isn't necessarily indicative of a longer term outcome. And so we're currently working to bring in longer term data to extend those simulations further to assess how much those those first uh, that that first year's worth of microbial interactions really matters. And um, we're really interested in this was a series of experiments conducted uh, in a single set of climate um, conditions and in in-text sagebrush stands. And both of those are factors that we would think might disrupt these interactions in meaningful ways, um, potentially removing some of that signal of local adaptation. But that's it. Um, thanks so much for having me. And uh, I can take any questions. Well, great. Thank you so much, Allison. And, and um, I do, we do have time for questions, but I just wanted to share, make sure that say in, uh, in the whole group, what somebody wrote in the chat, which is that the, the artwork on this is amazing. Oh, thanks. Thank <laughs> is you. That, is that yours or? Yes, yeah. Wow, great. Thanks. Um, we have a couple of questions. One this is an interesting two-part question here, kind of. When we're talking about microbial community, do we include fungi? And then the second part of the question is, do you think that, you know, there's some evidence that in forests that um, there's communication between um, plants through fungi. Do you think that rangeland plants also communicate through fungi? Yeah, I, I, I am hesitant to touch the forest communication through fungi question because I think that the, um, there's a lot of controversy surrounding some of that research. Um, and I think that there's mixed evidence for um, the benefits of that communication. Um, but in terms of like chemical signaling um, between plants, there's plenty of evidence of sagebrush chemically signaling following like herbivory and things like that. So I would imagine that that, that, might, um, that might be a possibility below ground too. Um, we're talking about in this particular case, we've added in, and this I think answers the second question uh, too, that um, we've added a, a live soil inoculum. So we've added a little bit of that soil, which technically includes a lot of different things. Although at the scale that we've added it, um, it's mostly um, going to be excluding things like any insects or arthropod type things that were in the soil. Um, we're focusing our sequencing on the ITS and 16S regions. So we will understand the impacts of the fungi and bacteria, although there could be other hitchhikers there too. So yes, mostly focused on fungi and bacteria. Okay. And then you, you started, you, you addressed a little bit. You said, Adrian asked, what was your inoculum? Is it mycorrhizal? Is it cyanobacterial? Is it both? It's a whole soil inoculum. And we are, um, we took a whole soil approach because we were interested in understanding kind of the site level signature of local adaptation. So understanding a role with a particular focal um, organism didn't seem as relevant in the initial stages, but as we are um, working our way through the sequencing data that we have, we're interested in exploring specific taxa um, that might be most relevant and sort of trying to manipulate those in experiments on their own in the future. Okay. Um, let's see, oh, Matt, Germino has a question. What are the implications of the findings for the use of fungicides in seeding, which is one of the seed coatings being tested in the Great Basin? Yeah, I think, I think this is a, it, I think this is a, an interesting question because I think our results suggest the same sort of things that people already recommend in many ways, which is that a local seed um, performs better. Um, and But that the translocated seeds actually are experiencing these really strong negative impacts of soil microbial communities. So I think in some ways the fungicides could be really helpful for a translocated seed and potentially quite harmful for um, a home seed. Um, but that also assumes that these microbial communities are going to be um, 
responding to climate in what we don't understand how these microbial communities are expected to respond to climate. And so I would um, imagine that there would be places in which some of these species interactions start to become either more severe or less severe or more intense or less intense than they have been historically, disrupting these sources of local adaptation. So I think based on these results, which is kind of like a mean set of conditions that we've used, um, the fungicide might benefit if a seed is being translocated far and wide. Um, but it's hard to say because there's there's such variable impacts across these different life history stages, both strong pathogenic impacts versus at, at the beginning of a um, of sagebrush's development and germination um, are very seem to be associated with very different set of taxa than the positive interactions later on too. So, okay, well, great. Well, thanks, Allison. I know there's at least one more question in the Q and A, and if you can get to it, you may be able to answer that. Sure. Um, but I do want to to keep us on track. So that was a, actually that answer was a perfect segue into, or the question too was a perfect segue into the next uh, presentation, which is the first of two uh, about the use of seed coatings coming from Matt Madsen's lab. So Amber Johnson is going to tell us about uh, breaking dormancy and increasing restoration success in native forbs. Yeah, Let's see if I can share my screen. Yeah, just like you said, um, I did a study on breaking dormancy and increasing restoration success of native forbs using both seed coating and different planting techniques. Um, and this was funded from the NRCS and uh, the Utah Division for Wildlife Resources. So like we've talked about a lot already, um, Historic restoration focused mainly on using introduced grasses, probably because they're available and they're easier to grow. They actually grew. Some of our natives don't establish very well. But more and more, we're realizing how important it is to restore native forbs after a disturbance. But even though we're realizing this, their use in restoration is still extremely limited. And there's several reasons for this. Seed is really expensive. Seed's difficult to obtain. It's difficult to obtain very much seed. Um, and the big point that I'm going to address is success with these native forb seeds is extremely low. Usually less than 5% of the seed you put out will actually grow and often plantings will fail entirely. Now, one reason that can contribute to this is a lot of our native forb species in the Great Basin are highly dormant. And this is beneficial to them evolutionarily because it allows them to sit in the soil across years and wait for a good year when they have more moisture and are more likely to actually establish. But in restoration, we don't really have the luxury of waiting for a good year to establish our native forbs. After a disturbance, we usually need to get seed out and growing right away, or else we can get, like in this picture, this situation was a fire in Southeast Idaho, and this particular area wasn't reseeded. And you can see the sagebrush died, and it's just taken over by cheatgrass. So we wanna prevent that. So we have to be able to break dormancy. And one way we break dormancy is with gibberellic acid or GA. GA is just a plant hormone that stimulates growth and germination. And traditionally it's been applied by soaking seeds in this GA or putting in a Petri dish and soaking the seeds um, on the blotter paper with the GA. But this hasn't been tested much in the field and it's kind of difficult to soak seeds and then go plant them in the field. So our lab developed an alternative method to apply gibberellic acid, and that's with a seed coating. This is a slow release seed coating, kind of conceptually diagrammed there on the right. You can see you've got your seed there and it's coated with a mix of ingredients, but it's got those GA polymers impregnated in that coating. So then as the seed coating breaks down, it releases the GA to the seed. So it slowly releases and slowly breaks dormancy to stimulate germination and growth of these native forbs. And if we can break dormancy, then that opens up um, a wider range of when we can plant our seeds. So traditionally we plant in the late fall, but we wanted to test if we can break dormancy and then plant in the early spring. Now the benefit for this would be in avoiding pathogenesis. So the cool, moist conditions in the soil over winter are highly conducive to pathogens. And a lot of seeds will die um, by being uh, attacked by those pathogens. 
So if we can plant in the spring, we can avoid the amount of time or lessen the amount of time that these seeds are exposed to those pathogens. Additionally, we wanted to test microsites. A good microsite can provide increased moisture and moderated temperatures for the seeds that can help um, increase their growth and success and establishment. And the way we do this in restoration is traditionally with these V-shaped furrows, these deep furrows. But with these native forbs, that can be a problem because native forb seeds tend to be very small, just a couple of millimeters. And those V-shaped furrows, the sides of the walls tend to slough off with precipitation or just time, gravity pulling down the soil. And then it buries these tiny seed seeds too deeply for them to emerge from it. So our lab created a modified technique where we took one of those V-shaped furrows and cut off the bottom edge and we made this U-shaped furrow. And that U-shaped furrow allows us to plant the seeds in the middle and put some distance between the seeds and the sidewall that might slough off so they don't get buried too deeply. So the objectives of this study were to test GA3 coated seed compared to uncoated control seed and to test these planted both in the late fall compared to the early spring and to test them planted in those deep U-shaped burrows compared to just shallow surface drill rows. So to test this, we chose three sites across Utah, Santa Quin, Sage Valley, and Enterprise. And these are all degraded rangeland sites that we we're trying to restore. The first up is Santa Quin, and this is a wildlife management area that's been the subject of restoration for several years now, and it's a pretty weedy site. The next is Sage Valley. Sage Valley is a pretty barren site. You can see in the picture, there's not much there. The first time I I took some of my undergrads to the site. Um, one of them had the sarcastic remark that he thought we were planting on the moon. Um, so there's just not gr much growing there. There was a fire there um, like five years ago and it just never really recovered. And then the last site is further south, but still similar climate conditions. Um, this is Enterprise and Enterprise was also burned. It was actually burned in 2021, just before we planted our study. And as great as our plans were, having all these study sites, there were complications. As was addressed already, 2021 was a very dry year. And at Sage Valley and Enterprise, we saw essentially no seedlings actually come up from anything we planted. So we couldn't really use data from those sites. But you can see, this is just a graph of precipitation where the gray in the back is the historic 30 year average. And the black line is what we got in 2021 after we planted. You can see it's quite a bit below average for most of the year. And so we think there just wasn't enough water for these plants to actually grow. Also at Sage Valley, we had some pretty extreme soil crusting where we developed these crusts that were several inches thick. And the only place we saw anything coming up was in the cracks between these crusts. And unfortunately we didn't plant in the cracks, we planted in straight rows. and so we think our seedlings couldn't get up through those crusts. The species we chose for this study are Palmer's penstemon, thick leaf penstemon, and firecracker penstemon. And these species we chose because previous research in our lab with germination trials showed that these were responsive to the gibberellic acid coatings. Um, and they're also pretty widely used restoration species and seed is more available than some other um, less common species. So to coat the seed, we used standard seed coating procedures. We use this rotary drum seed coater that you can see on the right there on the top. And the way this works is it has the disc on the bottom that spins around. You put the seed in and it spins the seed around. And then there's another smaller disc hanging from the top called the atomizer disc. And that also spins so that you can apply liquid ingredients to that atomizer disc and it'll spray the ingredients over the seeds to nicely coat them. So we start out, by applying the GA impregnated polymer to the atomizer disc over the seeds. We let it um, spin, cover the seeds, and then continue to spin to dry the GA onto the seeds. And then we pump binder, which is just a, a special glue, onto the atomizer disc as we applied calcium carbonate powder through that opening there over the seeds. And that makes a nice coating around the GA polymer that we added. So you can see the, the coated product on the bottom on the right there. And after we finished coating the seeds, we spit them out and dried them on a forced air dryer. 
In the field, we planted our study in a randomized split split plot design with six blocks. Um, each of our blocks was divided between deep furrows and the shallow drill rows, and each of those splits was further split between fall planting and spring planting. And then when, within each of those split split plots, we randomized our species and our seed treatments. Each treatment was planted in a two meter row. And when we planted in December, we went through and made all of the furrows, including the ones for the spring planting, so that when we came back in March, we could just hand plant and not have to furrow the rows at that point, just for, for logistical reasons. For data analysis, I took a bunch of undergrads out with me in May, and we essentially stuck our noses in the dirt and looked for these tiny little penstemon seedlings. They're kind of hard to see, they're very small, but we looked through all of the rows and counted any penstemon seedlings that had come up. And then we came back in August and counted how many had established then that end of the summer. I analyzed both of these using generalized linear mixed effects models with block as a random effect to account for the variation across the sites. And I used treatment, furrows, and season as fixed effects. And like I mentioned earlier, the only data we were able to actually use was from the Sanaquin site because the other two sites didn't have any emergence or establishment. So we saw some interesting results. It's kind of exciting. The GA seemed to be effective for some species. So this graph shows species on the x-axis going palmers and then thick leaf and the firecracker, and then emergence in the density of plants per meter on the y-axis. And the GA um, coded seed is in blue on the right, and the control seed is the tan on the left. So for Palmer's penstemon, we saw six times higher emergence when we coded the seed with GA versus um, the uncoded seed. The thick leaf penstemon, we saw 21 times higher emergence than the uncoded seed. But for firecracker penstemon, there wasn't a difference. The control and the GA coded seed performed about the same. And we saw almost the same pattern for establishment in August. Um, similar graph this time with establishment in August, the end of the summer. Palmer's penstemon had four times higher establishment when it was coated with GA versus the control seed. And thick leaf penstemon had 10 times higher establishment when it was coated with GA. And again, firecracker penstemon didn't really show a difference between these seed treatments. For our season of planting data, this graph is similar, but this time fall is that green bar on the left and spring planting is the blue on the right. You see overall with all of our species combined, we saw four times higher emergence in the fall than in the spring. And establishment was similar. We saw three times higher establishment in the fall planting versus the spring planting. Our deep furrows, this graph is the with those deep furrows in blue on the left, and then the shallow drill rows without furrows is the tan on the right. And overall, there was three times higher emergence from those deep furrows than from just the shallow drill rows. And there's two times higher establishment from those deep furrows than just from the shallow drill rows. So there's some important things to be learned from this and areas I think that weren't for the research. Notably, the Palmer's penstemon and the thick leaf penstemon had almost no emergence unless the seed was coated with GA. So this treatment with seed coating is very effective for those species at increasing our emergence. But this isn't doesn't work just uniformly for all species. It, all the species responded differently. And firecracker wasn't really affected by the GA. And there's several reasons for this, mostly dealing with the dormancy, we think, of that seed lot. So our firecracker seed lot was collected at, or was grown at a lower elevation than our palmers and thick leaf seed were collected. And we know that elevation plays a role in dormancy. So we think that could have affected it and maybe the firecracker seed was just less dormant. Additionally, there's some research that the maternal conditions of where the seed is grown can affect the dormancy of the, the next generation of seeds. So when grown in like a cultivated plot, this was kind of mentioned earlier, when grown in a cultivated plot, we think that dormancy is less for those future generations. There's some research out of the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources um, Great Basin Research Center that showed this for thick leaf penstemon. And our firecracker penstemon was grown in a production plot, whereas palmers and thick leaf were wild collections. So we think there was some differences in dormancy, but regardless, for any species we'd want to apply the GA for, this needs to be done on a species by species basis, and you need to evaluate 
how it would work for these different species, if it's needed for the different species, and probably also the rate of GA to be applied for the different species. Moving on to the, the season of planting. For us, the spring planting wasn't effective, which was opposite of what we expected. But again, it was a very dry year. So we think there just wasn't very much moisture in the spring for those seedlings or those seeds to be able to germinate. And this is something that should probably be tested again over multiple years. But there's also the factor that spring planting can be logistically difficult between like muddy or frozen soil. And then finally, our deep U-shaped furrows were very successful and increased the success of all of our species and treatments. And this is especially meaningful here in the Great Basin where we are trying to reestablish native vegetation um, where it's really important to get those native forbs growing again, but we have very dry years and we can't really predict effectively if we're going to be able to get things to grow. Those deep U-shaped furrows can increase our moisture so that even if it is dry, those seedlings might be able to get a little bit more moisture and have a slightly better chance at success. And then before I finish, I'd just like to thank all of the students in the BYU Rangeland Restoration Lab for the countless hours they spent with me counting seeds and little seedlings. And then with that, I guess I can take any questions. Great, thanks, Amber. Oh, I know you've given this talk several times. Um, and so, you know, I appreciate you being willing to do this for us again. <laughs> um, there's a question, comment from Ed Kleiner that I wanted to share and see whether you have any thoughts on it. it says on, on the farms that he works on, deep furrows on sandy soils are risky because they tend to be prone in the wintertime to, to get buried by precipitation or wind. Is there anything that you, any thoughts you have on that or ways you might have you know, you guys tried to address that kind of question? Yeah, so soil type definitely has a role in how effective these technologies would be. Those deep furrows, we've seen at sites where it, the soil is more sandy, that the furrows don't really hold up over time. And even in sites where they're less sandy, the longer time goes on, the less pronounced those furrows become. But the, the U shape to the furrows, we think really helps because it just puts the distance between the seeds and the sides of the furrow. But I think if it's a very sandy site, you might want to look to other techniques for restoration than these furrows. Okay. Um, there's another question here that you may not be able to answer, but I'll, so it says, are we looking down the GMO rabbit hole for native plants? And then, you know, looking at reduced fitness versus coating or via coating. I, I'm wondering, um, and I, I haven't ever thought about that, but. So actually one of the, because I don't know how much people are looking into genetically modifying um, our native seeds. I mean, with seed production, there is some genetic modifications happening anyway, just by selecting seeds. Um, but a big thing with dormancy, one reason we really prefer the, the idea of using seed coating rather than just trying to breed out the dormancy is because in future years, we're hoping those plants will sustain themselves. They'll reseed the area. And in those cases, you might need the dormancy. The dormancy can be beneficial. In restoration, we kind of need to break through the dormancy just to quickly establish vegetation, but we don't want to get rid of the prospect of dormancy for the future generations from any populations we establish. So if we use seed coating, we can artificially break dormancy at one point, but genetically those seeds might could still have dormancy like built into them. So future generations of those plants can be dormant and that could be helpful to the future population. If that makes sense. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> I and. I have a question for you and some work that I've done suggests that people like the idea of seed coating in principle, but are hard, find it hard to imagine that it will be um, feasible uh, on the scale that folks are rest restoring. Or do you, do you know of any sort of efforts to try and address that sort of scaling up issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's like the next step in our lab because 
there are agricultural seed coating facilities that can do large scale seed coating um, for that could be a big enough amount for like a restoration project. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be some some difficulties, I think, in transitioning from our small 31 centimeter seed coater <laughs> to a full restoration size seed coating efforts. But that's definitely that's the next thing we're looking into because it's it's all great for a, a little study, but for it to actually be effective, we definitely have to be able to scale it up. So that's that's going to take some more work, but we're we're looking at that as our next step. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Amber. And there's there are uh, there is a, a question that I we won't have time for. So if you can address it, that would be wonderful. But I do want to move to our next presentation, all about seed, also about seed coating, um, from Kyle Cook, who uh, is a lab mate of Amber's, um, and but using it in a very different way. All right, let me pull this up. Oops. All right, hopefully you're seeing my screen there. Uh, so I am glad to be with you today. Um, I wanna talk with you about improving direct seeding success of winter fat using seed coatings. And there's some overlap between my presentation and Amber's, but I'll try to keep that to a minimum. So winter fat, Christian and Nicovia Lanata. To answer your question, yes, I have nightmares about misspelling and mispronouncing that genus all the time. Uh, but this is a valuable plant species. Uh, this is valued highly on rangelands as its value is a winter forage species. It maintains high crude protein levels when other plants lose those cr crude protein levels during the winter. And that can be really helpful in getting animals through those lean, challenging months. The problem is, like many other native desirable plant species, it was historically overgrazed uh, by settlers moving west. And unfortunately, since it's been reduced, there's been limited recovery of the species in its native range. And in areas where winter fat has been reduced, uh, we have this problem of halogeton moving in. So when winter fat occupies a site and then it's grazed down, halogeton tends to be the species that moves in after it. And this creates a lot of problems. I mean, halogeton is not palatable and nutritious like winter fat. It's toxic to many animals. And halogeton, there's some research to suggest that halogeton alters the uh, microbiology in the soil to make it more difficult to establish winter fat after halogeton has invaded. So it can be really problematic. There is a lot of value to restoring winter fat to the landscape and fortifying existing winter fat stands to prevent halogeton from moving in. But what are the barriers to restoration? Well, there are many. Um, first, one of the most glaring barriers is flowability. So if you look at the middle picture there, that's demonstrating the flowability problems here. Winter fat has a very, very, well, it's, uh, the fruit is a utricle shown down on the bottom left. And those fruits are really fuzzy. And when you try to run them through planting equipment, they bridge and clog like you see in that middle picture. And what this does is it creates uh, a big pain in the neck for managers. And as a result, oftentimes they decide not to include winter fat in their seed mix. Um, understandably, right? So we have limited planting opportunities of winter fat. But then even in the somewhat rare occasions where we do plant it, uh, one, it's either included at low seeding rates or uh, the seeds don't establish very well. So if you look at the picture on the right, that is the, the result of most winter fat plantings. Um, and one of the reasons for this is winter fat germinates really quickly when conditions are right. So we'll plant these seeds in the fall uh, with the intent that they'll germinate and establish in the spring. But if you have a warm week or two in the fall or during the winter, those seeds will try to germinate and then uh, the following winter conditions come in and kill it. Uh, freezing, winter drought, and pathogen attack can be big problems for winter fat. Uh, if you look at the hairs again on the, on the surface of the fruit, those hairs increase the surface area on the fruit and that increased surface area provides prime habitat for pathogens. And then another 
barrier that's worth mentioning, even though it's not the focus of this research, is short shelf life. So most of these seeds die within two to three years on the shelf. So that's definitely a point where future research is needed. So flowability is a big issue. It's important to look at what we have tried to overcome flowability issues. Uh, first, we've looked at mechanical cleaning, such as by threshing. Now this normally involves removing the seed from the fruit and it's widely applied. Most of the people that I talk to that use winter fat, they use this method. Um, they'll take those seeds out of the fruit and then put that in their seed mix. The problem with this is there's research uh, to show that that uh, reduces uh, seedling vigor and reduces germination. So we have uh, problems with viability there. The trade-off is you can you completely eliminate uh, flowability issues by just planting those little seeds removed from the fruit. Uh, so that is a trade-off. We've also looked at using carriers like rice holes and cracked corn. You mix those in with the fruits. Um, the problem with this is it's it has limited efficacy. So we've tried this in our lab and we had to mix carriers uh, with winter fat in a ratio of five carriers to one part winter fat. So not very effective. And some of these carriers can attract rodents, which can encourage herbivory, uh, like cracked corn can do that. Flash flaming, this is an awesome method. So the grad student before me worked on this. And essentially what you do, or what he did, is he put the fruits in a seed coater, exposed them to an open flame for a brief period of time, uh, singeing those hairs down, making more uniform structure. And then he could coat that and then you can plant the fruit and the seed and have no flowability issues. Uh, the problem with this is that currently it's not very scalable. Uh, you have to do very small batches at a time um, and it's just not practical, very, very expensive. So what we look at is using seed coatings as a solution. Um, and one thing that's important here is the ability to coat is new. So the grad student who worked on flash flaming, he had to flash flame in order to apply a coating. If you just put winter, fats, winter fat fruits in a coater and try to coat it, uh, those hairs don't take the coating very well and it creates a mucky mess. Uh, but over the last couple of years, we've uh, practiced and figured out some, some methods where we can actually just put winter fat fruits in the coater and they will take that coating material. And that is important because it takes a step out of the production process. So now this is a more cost-effective way of improving flowability while leaving the seeds in the fruits. So what you're looking at here in this picture is our blank coating. Uh, this is basically just calcium carbonate. There's no active ingredient like a fungicide or a hydrophobic or any kind of chemical. Um, so the main benefit is just improving flowability. And this alone could increase restoration success of winter fat just by uh, making it easier for land managers to use, you know, increasing the planting opportunities, using it in more seeding projects. However, we can beef up these coatings um, and improve seedling establishment using active ingredients. So, for example, we talked about rapid germination as a problem. We can use hydrophobic seed coatings to address that problem. Essentially, you put a hydrophobic coating, a watertight seal around those coated fruits. And when you plant those fruits in the fall, that hydrophobic coating will keep the seed from imbibing moisture until the coating has degraded. So essentially until spring, and then that coating is degraded, then that seed will germinate and it's facing nice, easy spring conditions instead of tough winter conditions. Uh, so by delaying germination until spring, we can bypass all those winter hazards like freezing, winter drought, and pathogen attack. So essentially, we have one coating that solves two problems, flowability and poor seedling establishment. So here's what we did. Here's what our studies sought to accomplish. Um, one question we need to answer is, do coatings inhibit emergence? By putting a barrier around the outside of that fruit, are we going to trap seeds inside? No good throwing, good throwing bad seed on the ground, right? Another one is, uh, do coatings change planting protocols? By adding that barrier around the fruit, we are uh, requiring the seed to expend more energy during germination and emergence. So does that mean if we plant a coated seed uh, deeply, it's going to expend its energy resources before it emerges? So we need to know if planting depth changes as a result of seed coating. So that study to answer those two questions was our seeding depth trial. 
Second, how do coated seeds perform under realistic conditions? It's a cool story, but does it work? We got to try this technology out in habitat and mine reclamation projects. And then our third study, the question we wanted to answer was, can hydrophobic coatings really improve emergence? Again, awesome story, but does it actually work? And for that, we carried out hydrophobic trials in the field. So I'm not going to overlap what Amber said much, but this is the same coder, but you get an inside view here. Um, that big disc on the bottom is what holds the seeds and turns them through, uh, turns them inside that, uh, that drum. And then the smaller disc you're seeing is the atomizing disc. That's where you put the liquid material, the binder or the glue. And then that little disc atomizes or spreads that liquid material onto the seeds. Then you add your powdered material straight to the seeds. So a pretty cool machine here. I've spent a lot of time with that, as has Amber. All right, so first study, the seeding depth trial. Here's what we did. We compared control versus blank coated fruits. Again, that's just calcium carbonate uh, coated fruits at four planting depths from the surface down to about a half an inch. In three soil types, we had a loam, a sandy loam, and then a loamy sand. And we had eight replicate blocks. Um, <clears throat> And we used these hand furrowers to ensure precise seeding depth. Basically, these were cement groovers that uh, would install a furrow at a very precise depth. You place the seed in that furrow and pinch it closed. This was supposed to be an imitation of how a seed drill would work. We kept, and these were set up in a growth chamber, uh, and the growth chamber was set to 15 degrees Celsius on a 12-hour light and dark cycle. All flats were watered equally and we counted emergence uh, weekly for three weeks. It's important to note that nothing came up after week two. So this species does emerge quickly or germinate quickly when conditions are right. So this was the lab component to this study. Uh, we also had field replications of this study. And here's what we did here. We had four sites. We had a mine reclamation site up at Rio Tinto Tailings. We had Sanaquin, which was a wildlife management area. Uh, Sage Valley, which was a degraded rangeland site. That was the moon site that Amber talked about. And then Enterprise, which was also a degraded rangeland site that had burned recently. These were the same sites that we'd use for our hydrophobic trials that I'll talk, talk about later. So how we installed uh, these studies, we had furrowers installed uh, using furrowers pulled behind a tractor. And then within those furrows, within those furrows, we use the same hand furrowers as in the lab trial. And this was just to ensure that planting depth was consistent across field and lab trials. We planted studies in the fall of 2021, and we counted emergence in the spring of 2022. And here is what we found. So in the lab trial, um, this is what you're looking at uh, on the y-axis you're gonna see the percent emergence and then the soil type. And on the x-axis, you'll see our planting depths. Uh, the lighter color is control seed and the darker color is coated seed. And just as a, this is a lot going on in this figure. So basically what we saw was that shallow planting depths produced the best results for both treatments. Um, and as you got deeper emergence went down and that's what we expected. And then we had lower emergence in that sandier soil. One thing that we found that was surprising was that when you sow seeds on the soil surface, the coated seeds did better than the non-coated seeds. So uh, that was a surprise. We didn't think there would be a change because this is a blank coating, no active ingredient. It's not really supposed to improve emergence, but it did on the soil surface. And um, one reason we think this might be is because those coatings uh, they can improve seed soil contact. They allow the fruits to settle down into the soil, whereas the hairs of uncoated fruits, uh, they kind of prop the fruit up above the soil surface. Uh, the hairs stand them up, and that may decrease seed soil contact. That could be the reason we saw that. In our field trials, however, um, so we saw overall the same patterns of planting depth uh, influencing emergence, right? Shallow planting depths yielded the best results, but that effect on the soil surface was not significant in the field. The reason for this we think is that over the winter, um, water, snow kind of helped the non-coated seeds settle down into the soil. So then you had a uh, similar seed soil contact between coated and non-coated seeds. But a big takeaway here is that by coating seeds, we're not hurting emergence. That was our initial 
question is, are we going to trap seeds? And we're not. Uh, so this means you can improve flowability with seed coatings and not worry about hurting emergence. So now we wanted to test this technology out in the real world. So we went to five sites. Um, one was a, the same Rio Tinto tailings impoundment. That was a mine reclamation site. And the other four were habitat improvement projects. All of these involved mechanical treatments uh, to remove pinion and juniper, such as bull hog, chains. Um, and they were for different purposes, for big game, for sage grouse, for there was one that involved prairie dog translocation. Uh, so lots of different projects going on here. And at each site, we had one acre plot set up. Half of it was control, half of it was coated seed. And we brought, broadcasted the seeds at 7 PLS pounds per acre. Control, we just spread it by hand as evenly as we could because there's no other good way to broadcast that seed. And then coated, we uh, broadcasted that seed with the chest broadcaster. Planted studies in the fall of 2021 and counted in the spring and fall of 2022. And here's what we found. So as far as density, um, density was similar between control and coated plots. In other words, we're seeing the same number of individual plants come up regardless of whether the seed is coated or not. Frequency was different between treatments though. Um, Frequency was much, well, not much higher, but it was significantly higher for coded plots than control plots. And essentially what this is saying is that our samples, our hoops that we we're putting down, we're picking up um, coded seedlings more often than control seedlings. So for example, this is what a plot might look like if it was non-coded seed. Uh, the wind is gonna blow those non-coded seeds into catchment areas like basins up against stumps, um, wherever the wind's gonna blow them. And then in those locations, the seedlings are going to come up in high densities. But the coatings hold the seeds down, and so they're not wind blown, and so you end up with a more uh, evenly distributed stand. So whether that's a benefit or a detriment might be up to the interpreter, but that's one consideration when using coatings is that you're not going to have those wind blown seeds. And then a couple other observations from this study. So first, catchment zones were important, like we said. And then there were a couple of projects that ended up not being treated for one reason or another. They, they'd never had equipment go out in bull hog or never chained. Um, and on, in those areas, there was no mechanical action in the soil. And we saw very low emergence in those areas. So in the middle picture, you're looking at an excavator track. And in that excavator track, um, this is what we found, lots of seedlings. And this is just a reminder that mechanical action is important in planting those seeds. There are other considerations with mechanical action. Are you gonna open up for weed invasion? You know, But this is one consideration. It does help seedlings to come up. And then the picture on the right just shows one of those catchment areas I'm talking about where winter fat seeds will be blown by the wind into an area like that and grow in really high densities. All right, finally, this is our hydrophobic coating trial. So we use the same four sites as the depth trial and we had control seed versus blank coated seed versus hydrophobic coated seed. And we installed furrows using those tractor pulled furrowers. And then all seeds were planted just barely below the surface, uh, 3.2 millimeters, that's about an eighth of an inch deep. And we used a hydrophobic polymer. This was a 7% ethocell in acetone solution. Ethocell is the hydrophobic material. Acetone is just a carrier to get that material onto the seeds, and then that will vaporize off of the seed in the coder. And here's what we found. So we counted the number of live, dead, and total seedlings on the site. Um, so looking at live seedlings, what we saw was that the hydrophobic treatment produced the greatest number of live seedlings. Um, and this was, this was a big difference between the control or blank coated seeds. So what this tells us is that there is potential in this treatment. There's still a lot of research that needs to be done, but that hydrophobic coating did seem to improve emergence compared to the control or blank coated seeds. And then we also looked at average mortality percent. This, we just did this by um, looking at the number of dead seedlings that we were able to detect, comparing that with the total uh, uh, well, with the number of live seedlings. And what we saw was that the hydrophobic 
treatment produced the lowest mortality percent. So these two results combined say suggest that uh, hydrophobic coatings may indeed reduce winter mortality by delaying germination and improve emergence in the spring. So like I said, there is a lot of research that still needs to be done on this. For instance, we only use one rate of hydrophobic material. You could potentially use multiple rates of hydrophobic material um, to delay germination for different amounts of time. This could be used as a bet hedging strategy. Um, there, there is a lot that needs to be done still, kind of like Amber said, the coding uh, process is kind of young and scaling up is an issue, but this def definitely shows that there's potential to this treatment. And so in conclusion, just real quick, coatings do not inhibit emergence um, and we can plant them in the same way that we plant non-coated seeds. In our habitat projects, we learned that coatings can create more uniform stands. We learned that catchment areas and mechanical action are important for untreated seeds. And then in our hydrophobic trial, we learned that hydrophobic coatings may improve emergence and that we need to keep looking at this as a potential solution to this problem. And then with that, I'd like to thank everyone who helped out with this study, and I will take any questions that you have. Great. Thanks, Kyle. We, we're um, close to the end of our time, but there is one question that came in, and I, you sort of alluded to this, so maybe you can expand a little bit. The question was, will you test for clump versus uniform seed distribution in establishment? And, you know, because it seems like natural populations evolved to have clump distribute, distribution. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can, you know, you, you did talk about this a little bit, but, you know, do you, what are your thoughts about, about, you know, which of those might be better or different or how that worked out? That's a great question. I actually think there are advantages to having those clumps. Um, there are disadvantages too, though, because some of those sites that didn't receive any mechanical action um, and that didn't receive mechanical action and were on very flat terrain, there were no catchment areas. And so those seeds, I don't know where they are. They weren't on the site. Um, and so if you want to plant winter fat in a certain area, you want to keep it in that area, right? And so just having uh, having no catchment areas, that, wind, that wind's going to blow the seed out of your area. It's not going to help you much. Um, but, by, uh, but by coating the seeds, you can keep them in place. Or if you're going to plant non-coated seeds, just having those catchment areas can, can help uh, the success of your project. Great. Well, thanks, Kyle. And um, thanks to all of our speakers so far. We have reached um, a change in, in our program now. We're going to have a chapter business meeting for the next, um, you know, an hour or so. What I'm going to suggest is that we do take a short break um, just for folks to, you know, to sort of gather themselves and, and uh, you know, do anything you really need to do right away. But I'd like to come back in, let's see, it, it is, my watch says 12.03, my phone. So let's try and regather at 12.08. For those of us who want to participate in the business meeting, if you don't, that's fine. Uh, you will be able to go back to, sorry, uh, or it could be 11, 1108. Um, <laughs> if, if you don't want to participate in the, in the chapter meeting, would like, we really hope you'll come back at 115 Mountain, 1215 um, Pacific time for the start of the, the scientific program again. But in the meantime, I will see you in uh, about five minutes and we'll have our chapter business meeting. Well, I'm excited to be here at this virtual meeting and I'd like to thank um, Mark and Corey for being such great organizers and facilitators of this meeting. And so as Mark mentioned, I'm going to be talking about a larger scale issue um, that affects our region and that is the impact of human population growth. And I wanna be sure to acknowledge my co-authors on this study, um, Jody Brandt, who is an associate professor at Boise State, Juan Rakanen Malor, who's a postdoc and the lead author of this study, and Matt Williamson, who is an assistant professor at Boise State. And so, as 
people have alluded to throughout this conference, uh, Sagebrush Step is in danger. And that has motivated a lot of these restoration efforts. And I think one thing that is important to point out here is just how vast this region is. So from British Columbia to New Mexico, and a region that spans about 8% of the contiguous United States and is in severe threat with over half of intact sagebrush step lost. And so that's an ongoing process that's related to invasive plants, fire, climate change. But there's another huge change happening in this region. And that is that human population is exploding across the West. And so here is an example of um, two cities, Boise and Reno, and the green in that map on the left-hand side, it illustrates sagebrush habitat. And on the right-hand side, you can see maps of these cities with the red indicating land that was built after 2000. And these cities are growing pretty rapidly. And across the region, our regional population has increased by about 2 million people over this 30 year period. And so as human populations expand, what um, pressures are those expanding populations going to put on our native sagebrush habitat? Um, and so I think as people that live in the West, we recognize this and um, certainly there's a lot of public interest and concern over the consequences of our region's growth. But this hasn't, this human growth hasn't really been related that much to um, vegetation dynamics across the region. And I think when we consider the impacts of um, development, it's easy to think about the immediate footprint of development. And so here is a, some exurban sprawl outside of Boise. And you can see in these hills that are surrounding this new suburban development, there's some great sagebrush habitat, but where the suburban houses have been built, it's just total decimation of, of that sagebrush. Um, and so I think people are people that are interested in ecology and conservation are often pretty alarmed about this. Um, encroachment into natural habitat. But the reality is that when we look at the immediate footprint of land that's being developed um, relative to this vast area, it's pretty small. So about 60% of this um, region is public land that's managed by the federal government. Um, another big chunk is managed by state and local agencies. And another chunk is in agriculture. And so the actual footprint of expanding cities and other places where people live is a tiny sliver of this whole land. So given, given that, um, given the small proportion that humans take up across our American West, um, I think it's reasonable to ask the question, does human population growth matter outside of that immediate footprint of development? And this is the question that we aimed to answer with our study. And so to answer this question, we took advantage of the Landsat Satellite Archive um, with Landsat-derived indices of rangeland quality. And those that index of rangeland quality is an integrative measure that combines sagebrush, non-sagebrush shrub, and herbaceous fractional cover. So it's balancing out those fractional covers to get to what a healthy rangeland should be like. And that is the baseline ASI. And then deviations from that indicate degradation in rangeland condition. And so we use this satellite product to um, map changes in rangeland quality across over 250 million acres in 121 counties across nine states. And we only sampled. Landsat pixels that were in sagebrush steppe habitat. So we're deliberately excluding the places that have been converted from sagebrush to something else. Instead, we're interested in what happens to 
places that have remained sagebrush during this entire time period. And then we tested impacts of human population growth using a couple of covariates. So one of those covariates was human population per county per year. Um, so counties have different growth rates and some counties in this region are growing really fast. Others are remaining stable. Others are losing population. And we also looked at accessibility in terms of distance in travel time to major cities defined um, as population centers of 50,000 people and above in this study. And so the shorter the travel time, the more accessible a pixel is to a city. And finally, we wanted to compare the effect of these covariates on um, other biophysical covariates that are well known to have an impact on rangeland quality, and that includes climate variables, temperature and precipitation, um, whether a pixel was burned or not, and topographic variables, including elevation and slope. So we wanted to know the relative effect of being close to a city or in a county that is growing quickly compared to um, these biophysical covariates. And finally, we also controlled for pixel membership in different um, land tenure types, including federal, private land, state, local land, and tribal land. And then we used a hierarchical Bayesian approach to model um, all of these covariate, the effect of all these covariates on rangeland quality while accounting for spatial and temporal autocorrelation. Um, across our multi-decadal, multi-state data set. So what are the results here? Um, well, here is what the um, accessibility and human population growth covariates look like. So those are panels B and C, and panel A shows the rangeland quality map. Um, and so in terms of human population growth, you can see those dark purple counties are the counties that are growing really fast. Um, and in panel C with accessibility time, um, you can see that even though we might think of this region as pretty inaccessible, there are mo most places across this region are within um, less than five or so hours to a population center. And so to run our models, we ran our models both on this whole area outlined in blue, but we also chose three, the three fastest growing counties in Idaho, Nevada, and Utah to run separate models to look at a finer scale, um, look at finer scale patterns of how these covariates are affecting rangeland quality. And so our results, well, Across this region in this 30 year pot time period, we see a total decrease in rangeland quality of almost 15%. And so this isn't a new result. A lot of other studies that have used these remote sensing products have shown declines in sagebrush cover, um, declines in rangeland quality. And our study just confirms that across this region, um, we are seeing these huge, these pretty big decreases in. Um, ecological integrity. And what is new here is that we related those declines to our covariates for human population, human population in the counties and accessibilities. And so this figure, this figure shows the relative effect size of um, different covariates with the vertical line at zero indicating no effect. And then these effects that are on the negative side of zero have a negative impact and the ones that are on the other side have a positive impact. And so what should catch your eye when you look at this is that temperature and um, fire occurrence have by far the biggest impact on rangeland quality and both of those covariates resulted in declines in rangeland quality. Um, not a huge surprise, but what is perhaps surprising here is that the effect of human population was also um, negative. And what I'd like to emphasize here is that when we look at the relative effect size of human population, 
it's on about the same level as um, number of fires, precipitation, elevation, and slope. So I think those variables, elevation, slope, number of fires, are all variables that we immediately think of as related to the resilience and resistance of um, our vegetation dynamics across this region. And what we're showing is that human population growth has a comparable impact to those well-known drivers of resilience. Um, and we also found a pretty certain effect of accessibility. And accessibility has a negative effect, which means that actually the further away you are from a city, the worse your rangeland quality gets. So we have these interesting contradictory results here, and I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about why we think those patterns exist. Um, and when we ran our separate models for the county level analyses that look at these patterns within a county, um, we found very similar results, which um, is useful in confirming our uh, initial study at a different smaller scale. Uh, and so looking a bit more closely at the effect of human population and travel time, for every 60,000 people added to a county, you get a 4%, a predicted 4% decline in rangeland quality. And then when travel time increases by about 3.5 hours, you get a decrease in rangeland quality of 2%. So those are just ways of understanding these complicated modeling results. And when we look at these effects relative to land tenure, um, we didn't find a major difference between these land tenure types. However, I'd like to emphasize that our study wasn't designed to address this question. And I think this data set is really ripe to look at the effect of land tenure on rangeland quality, but it would require a different sampling scheme. Um, and so to kind of get into some conclusions here, what we found is that rangeland quality declines more in fast growing counties than slow growing counties. The effect size is comparable to well-known drivers of resilience and resistance. And again, I'm emphasizing that these declines occur outside the immediate footprint of development. So if we had, if we had included land that was converted from sagebrush into something else, we would see even bigger effects here. And when we think about the effects, the contradictory effects of rangeland quality of, uh, sorry, of accessibility and population growth, I think it's useful to think about this in a spatial way. So here's a county boundary. There's a city at the center of this county. And what we expect to find based on these results is that in the area immediately near the city, we actually have higher rangeland quality than we would expect on average. And then in this fast growing county, in the edges of that county, far from the city, we have the predicted worst rangeland quality. And so what could be explaining these spatial patterns? Um, well, I think one explanation is that a lot of cities in the region have realized that our natural resources that are used for recreation and for ecosystem services are under threat. So there is intense land management very close to cities. And an example of that in Boise are our land levies that have protected uh, more than 10,000 acres of public space in the foothills near Boise. I think another potential explanation for that pattern is that there are recreational differences. So perhaps appreciative recreation like hiking is more common close to cities and then more destructive forms of recreation like uh, ATV use are more prevalent further from cities. And so fast growing counties um, might have an increase in both types of recreation, but the uh, destructive recreational activities are causing more damage. Uh, and further research, research will be required to test these hypotheses. So to conclude, um, demographic changes in human populations are impacting sage for a step. And I think we need to start considering this population growth as one of the drivers of degradation that we commonly cite, um, including along with invasive species and fire. And what we really thought a lot about while we were writing this is that currently there's a real patchwork of land types that are managed differently um, across this region. 
uh, from federal land to land that's managed by cities. And I think our results emphasize that changes to sagebrush step in terms of rangeland quality aren't confined to a particular boundary. And so we need more regional coordination to manage this patchwork of land types. And finally, from a research perspective, um, many other places, many other ecosystems across North America have a long history of urban studies um, in ecosystems like the temperate forests of the Northeast um, or prairies in the Midwest. And I think we've really lacked that urban ecology perspective for sagebrush steppe, but it's time that we start thinking about sagebrush steppe, not as a totally rural wild ecosystem, but something that is embedded in a matrix of human use, including cities. Um, and if you're interested in reading more, here is the paper. And I'm also happy to send you a PDF if you want. Um, and with that, I'd like to acknowledge our funding from NSF and my lab and our remote sensing collaborators on this. And that's it. Uh, thanks, everyone. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Great. Thanks, Trevor. And we do have time for a question or two. And we, we have one. Um, David asks, looks like state and local rangeland quality is significantly lower than federal. Yeah, I wouldn't say significantly. So um, there is a lot of, I'll share that, I'll share that slide again. Um, so yes, federal rangeland quality is lower on average, but if you look at those uncertainty intervals, they overlap the baseline, which is indicated by this vertical line quite a bit. So we're really not comfortable in saying that there is a significant change in federal land. And I think to really, I think this would be a great question to get at, but to really get at this well, you need to have a sampling design that chooses pixels in federal land that are comparable to the other land uses because of the history of this land, a lot of um, federal protected land ended up being on less productive, worse areas to begin with. So to really test this, you'd have to control for that. Okay. And then one, one other question from Francis Kilkenny. Um, so he understands, and I've heard the same thing, that within the Snake River Plain near Boise, a huge number of fires are human caused. So how does that factor into uh, what you're... Yes. Uh, yeah. um, so we actually have a student that's looking at this question now. Um, they'll look at the spatial pattern of natural versus human ignition of fires. Um, but in this study, we controlled for fires in two ways. We controlled for fire occurrence and number of fires. And so we expect that at least to some degree, um, our human population covariates are independent of the fire, fire effects. Great, thanks. I'm gonna, um, we've got, they've got some more questions in the chat, in the Q and A. So you may wanna try and respond to those if you can, but I wanna move us to the next talk cause we're, we're at time. Um, so thanks Trevor. And we will move to Alana Feldman. So um, we heard, you know, we've, we've been hearing a lot about uh, rangelands and drylands. And uh, so this is our, our one opportunity to hear from a different kind of system. Alana works uh, with Dr. Karin Kettering uh, here at Utah State University uh, on <clears throat> Phragmites uh, and restoration of landscapes that are wetlands that have been invaded by, by Phragmites. So Alana, go for it. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so yeah, very different system, but I've been surprised at how closely related uh, my findings will be to a lot of the findings of everyone else here. So hopefully directly applies to all of your research as well. Um, so I will be talking about my thesis research, which looks at the effects of seed mix density and composition on invasion resistance to um, Phragmites australis. 
So I'll start off with some background to my experiment, um, some previous experiments that inspired my work, some recent findings that I've had from my own work, and then some important next steps for this research. Um, so many of you uh, likely already know this, but biotic resistance is the ability of a native community to prevent invasion by an invasive plant. And um, there's been a lot of work on things that contribute to biotic resistance. So we know that high density is really important because it can help us overcome the high seedling mortality that naturally, or the high mortality that naturally occurs in seeding. We also know that both high density and high diversity are important for filling niche space and um, using up resources before an invader can come in. Um, but particularly in wetland systems, we haven't had a lot of research looking at multiple levels of density and multiple levels of diversity and how those may interact um, so that we can make recommendations to land managers about how to be promoting invasion resistance in these systems. And so I want to point out that um, in this talk, I refer to diversity and I'm referring to functional diversity in this case. So within the lab, we use these very broad functional groups when we talk about diversity. So those are annual forbs, perennial forbs, um, rushes, bulrushes, and grasses. And I tend to clump these together into just two groups, depending on what the results look like. Um, so just talking about forbs and graminoids. Um, so I'll start off by talking about some previous experiments from other members of the lab that inspired my work. And um, those experiments were really meant to answer the questions, does native seeding density um, reduce Phragmites growth? And then which types of native plants um, actually reduce Phragmites growth? And so the invader I'm interested in in this, um, this project is specifically Phragmites, um, but I believe that a lot of these results are going to be applicable to other invasives and wetland systems as well. So first I wanna talk about the dissertation work of um, Emily Tarsa. Um, so for her, uh, her project, she seeded um, a bunch of native plants at different densities and then also Phragmites at different densities and had a full factorial design um, to look at all of these seeded plants together in a mesocosm, um, which is essentially a kiddie pool. Um, and Emily specifically looked at only graminoids in her project. And this is because most land managers around the Great Salt Lake currently are using bulrushes and grasses um, for their restoration plantings and are not yet um, really getting into using forbs in their work. So the main takeaway from Emily's work was that Phragmites biomass is driven not by the number of native seeds, but by the number of Phragmites seeds. And so this is an important reminder um, for all types of restoration that seeding um, by itself is not going to uh, remove the native plants in an area. If you have a lot of seeds in the seed bank or if you have a lot of invasive seeds coming in from surrounding areas, um, that's going to have an effect on the amount of invasives in an area not simply just the native community. However, um, Emily did find that sowing more native, so sowing at a higher density, does lead to increased native biomass, which has other important um, benefits for the community. So that leads us to the work of Ray Robinson, who graduated with her master's in our lab and is currently working as our lab manager. Um, so Ray um, took the next step of this experiment, which was um, creating more native seed mixes that also included forbs. So for Ray's work, she had a 100% graminoid seed mix and a 100% forb seed mix, and then a series of seed mixes um, that had both forbs and graminoids somewhere along um, that gradient. And in opposition to Emily's work, Ray actually found that seed mixes that included forbs did in fact reduce Phragmites cover. Um, so uh, Emily working with graminoids had not found this effect of native plants, but it looks like when we add forbs into these seed mixes, um, it does seem to reduce Phragmites cover. Um, however, I will say that Ray was not able to replicate this in the field. Um, and I'll talk about that more at the end of the presentation. And uh, we'll actually, um, I'm interested in any feedback that any of you might have about that. 
So that leads me to uh, my own experiment, which is looking at native plant density and diversity together in their interactions that might limit Phragmites growth. Um, so I'll start by talking about my first greenhouse experiment that took place um, about a year ago this time. Um, and the purpose of this experiment was to grow um, Phragmites with individual native plants and see if any of these individual native plants were able to um, affect Phragmites from growing when seeded at different densities. So I had 18 different native species that I looked at. I planted them at um, either a low density of what we called 1x, which is the current density that land managers are using at the Great Salt Lake, or a high density that we called 5x, um, which is five times that amount. And then I also had a Phragmites presence treatment. So I had pots um, that had only the one native plant in them, pots that had only the Phragmites, and pots that had um, the native plant grown with the Phragmites. And I think um, one of my main takeaways you can actually see very clearly in this picture here, which is that some plants did very well um, and seemed to completely um, take over the tubs they were grown in um, within just a couple of weeks and other plants really didn't uh, grow at all. So you'll see that again on this first graph that I have here. So this is a graph um, of the raw data looking at reduction in Phragmites. So the x-axis is um, each of the uh, 18 native species that I grew. I just have the codes here, but I'll give you the names of um, the full names of the important ones uh, later in the presentation. On the y-axis, I have the change in Phragmites biomass. So the red line in the middle um, shows you the 0% change, so no change at all when Phragmites was grown with a native plant to when it was grown by itself. And then everything below that red line had a reduction in Phragmites growth. Um, and my first takeaway uh, that you can see here is that species identity had a significant effect on Phragmites, and we tested this with a generalized linear mixed model. And so what this means is that some of these species are better than others at reducing Phragmites growth. We also found that high density significantly reduced Phragmites. So this would suggest that regardless of your seed mix, if you can afford to plant at the 5x density instead of the 1x, um, you're going to see greater reduction in Phragmites. Um, and we found that there was no interaction between these two. However, um, I would argue, even though we didn't see this statistically, that when you look at those plants that are at the bottom of the graph, and so had almost a 100% uh, percent reduction in Phragmites growth, that it looks like you could plant at the lower density and get away, um, get away with that and still have the same reduction in Phragmites. So I would argue that some of these plants um, don't require the high density to have this effect. Uh, and when we zoom in and we look at which of these plants were in fact best at reducing Phragmites, um, we see that all of these are forbs. And I'll show pictures of those um, in a couple slides. So these are four more graphs. Um, so these are all the combinations of Phragmites biomass and cover and native biomass and cover. Um, and you don't have to um, look closely at all of these graphs. The main takeaway is that there is a negative relationship, a significant negative relationship in all of these. So when you have more native biomass in cover, that seems to be preventing Phragmites from growing and you have less Phragmites biomass in cover. And then again, when you zoom in and you look at which of these plants um, are having this effect, you see that almost all of them are forbs. So this continues to suggest that we should be including more forbs in our seed mixes. And so these are the four plants that did the best um, in this experiment. Um, all of them are um, annual forbs. Um, actually, that is not true. All of them are forbs. They're a mixture of annual and perennial forbs. Um, and the thing that is true about all of these plants is that all of them grow quickly. Um, they're actually sometimes considered weedy by plant managers because of how quickly they're able to grow. Um, and they produce large amounts of biomass and very large leaves. Um, so we didn't test this, but um, I suspect that because they are growing quickly, they're able to use up resources such as light um, or other uh, resources that are available to them before Phragmites is able to use them. 
So now I will get into my second greenhouse experiment, um, which I just completed a couple of weeks ago. So all of these results are preliminary, um, but this was a similar experiment, but the purpose of it was to look at how Phragmites biomass and cover change with seeding density and functional evenness. So I had the same two um, seeding densities that I had in my first experiment, the 1x and the 5x, um, and I had the same Phragmites presence treatment. Um, so I have some that are only native plants, some only Phragmites, and some with both. But I also have this evenness treatment. And what that means is that um, all of my seed mixes included the same nine species in them. I had three grasses, three forbs, and three bulrushes. Um, but I had a grass mix that um, had a simple majority of grasses, a forb mix that was a majority of forbs, a bulrush mix that was majority bulrushes, and then an even mix that was um, just one third um, grasses, forbs, and bulrushes. And so this is a stacked um, bar chart of the final cover um, at the end of my monitoring. And what you can see here is that um, the bulrushes didn't really grow. The Phragmites also didn't really grow, which is good. Um, so the majority of the cover was due to the forbs and the grasses and particularly the forbs. So regardless of how many forbs started out in the seed mix, um, they were able to spread out and dominate the cover. And forbs are the majority of the cover in all of my, um, all of my tubs, um, except for the high density grass treatment, um, which will come up in the next slide again. So this is another um, reduction graph. Again, the um, raw data that I have um, showing reduction in Phragmites from when it was grown with these native seed mixes to when um, it was grown uh, by itself. And we can see here um, that uh, I don't have a red line on here and that's because all of these treatments were able to reduce cover. And so we see that again, all treatments reduced Phragmites. Um, higher density seems to have had greater reduction than the lower density. So the higher density is in red, the lower density in blue. I haven't tested this statistically yet, um, but there does seem to be a difference between those two seeding densities. Um, we see that high and low density forbs uh, actually perform similarly compared to the other groups. So similar to my first experiment, I sus suspect that um, this means that some of the forbs in my mixes could be planted at a lower seeding density and we could still see um, the same effects as planting at the higher density. And then we also see that um, the grass does just as well as the forbs in the high density treatment, which was majority grass, um, but not as well in the low density treatment. Um, so this seems to suggest that there is some potential that if we are choosing between planting grasses and forbs, um, depending on the goals of the land manager, um, you could plant very high density grasses and see a reduction in Phragmites, um, or you might be able to save money by um, by seeding low density forbs and having the same effect. So these are the takeaways from my experiments um, so far. Um, so first of all, grass and forbs both show promise um, at being able to reduce Phragmites. And for forbs, um, it's particularly that those forbs that grow quickly and produce a lot of biomass that might do the best. Um, we also see that high density reduces Phragmites. So if you can afford to seed at a higher density, that might be a better route to take. Um, and there is no interaction between density and diversity. However, I would still argue that some of these forbs could be planted at a lower density to help land managers save money and still see the same effects. However, there is a major caveat um, to everything I just told you, which is that in the lab, we have not been able to reproduce these findings um, in the field. And we're not really sure why that is yet. Um, so definitely let me know if you have any ideas. Um, more work needs to be done looking at dormancy breaking and germination, um, as well as doing experiments under a variety of different environmental conditions um, in the greenhouse to figure out if it's a dormancy issue, if they're germinating, but they're just not growing after that, um, to figure out exactly which conditions are preventing their growth in the field. Um, and I will mention that um, 
our lab is already working on all of these things. Um, so we have a bunch of dormancy and germination experiments that have already taken place and are being written up right now. Um, we have two members of the lab that are testing different environmental conditions in the greenhouse. Um, but hopefully other labs are also working on this um, and we can sort of um, get down to the bottom of this so we can make helpful recommendations to land managers about Forbes. Um, and with that, I would like to uh, thank my funders and I am happy to take any questions. Well, great. Thanks, Solana. And we do have time for some questions and I'm gonna take the opportunity to ask one first, just because, um, so I'm thinking about persistence. Mm -hmm. um, I seem to recall last week that in Jess's research, they found that the Rumex, for example, was gone the second year and maybe the Epilobium too, I can't recall. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense of, of um, whether this effect would last beyond, beyond the, the initial establishment phase? Um, so that is a great question. I do have a field experiment as well that I didn't talk about. Um, and sort of as I alluded to in my first year, of um, analysis. I have not seen this effect in the field, but I will be monitoring it for a second year. Um, so starting to sort of answer that question. Um, but one, um, there are studies that have shown that um, particularly in wetlands, the most important phase for restoration is just getting the plants um, to germinate, not necessarily getting them to um, establish and remain. So this would suggest that if we're able to get these to actually germinate in the field, that's going to have pretty major effects um, on their ability to show these effects in the field. And after that establishment is, um, is pretty easy and it's not as much of a bottleneck as the germination phase is. Okay, great, thanks. Um, we have a question from David who asks, um, did you differentiate between native and invasive strains of Phragmites? And he, he points out that uh, he'd hate to lose native Phragmites because we're so anxious to control the invasives. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. And then he's going okay. to say question. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so, um, in the areas that we're working in as a lab around the Great Salt Lake and Utah Lake, um, specifically at the sites we are at, um, there is no native, we don't have the native strain of Phragmites. I know it does exist in other, um, other places in other Great Salt Lake wetlands, um, but so we haven't tested that um, directly yet. The idea of these experiments really is um, for land managers to reseed after they have already removed invasive Phragmites from the area. Um, so all of these are intended to be used um, to prevent invasive Phragmites from coming back to an area where we know um, that it has already been removed and is, um, has a large seed bank in the area. Um, but that, that's a really good point that we wouldn't necessarily want to exclude native Phragmites depending on our habitat goals. Okay. Um... All right, well, we're at 155. So there is one more, David had a second question that you may be able to answer by typing into the Q&A. Um, but we'll go to the next talk, which is by Sophia Kutsukas, um, who is currently a postdoc with Kent State University, although I don't believe you were in Ohio as we do this. Definitely um, not. <laughs> and uh, this is work that I, uh, I know it's just, I got an email last night that it had been officially published in Restoration Ecology. Yes, after some USGS pull-ups, but that was on my, that was my fault, okay. <laughs> um, so that's exciting to finally get it out there. Um, let me share my sc screen. Okay, all good, awesome, okay. Um, Thank you, Mark, for that introduction. Um, so yeah, as Mark said, I'm a postdoc at Penn State right now, um, still working in the Great Basin, but hosted at Penn State. Um, and I will be talking now about my research that I did um, during my PhD at Utah State, where I worked with Kari Bevelin as my advisor. And then we worked with Dave Pike, Mark Brunson, Jacob Baggio, and Carmen Calzada Martinez, kind of looking at his general approach of preemptive restoration, and how do we do it in the Great Basin? 
So first I want to talk about nurse shrubs. Um, nurse shrubs are a very common phenomenon in arid and semi-arid systems. Uh, the microenvironment around these shrub canopies is generally a lot less harsh than the surrounding inner spaces. Um, and this nicer environment, microenvironment leads to more establishment and persistence of understory vegetation around the shrubs. There's basically this clustering of vegetation around the woody canopy that we can see in this photo here. This is a, um, in the Mojave Desert in the summer, so all of these grasses have senesced, but you can kind of see these halos of vegetation, of understory vegetation around these creosote shrubs. And in this kind of simplified version of a shrubby, patchy kind of system, you have a shrub with understory growth kind of happening around it, a less vegetated or unvegetated inner space, and then you hit the canopy of the next sagebrush or the next shrub. Um, theoretically, the microenvironment around a sagebrush is going to provide a bunch of above ground benefits, being shade and lower soil and air temperatures. Um, more seeds and top and like less are going to be deposited around those shrubs, um, and the seeds that do grow there are going to be protected from herbivory for the most part. Below ground, there is increased soil moisture from hydraulic redistribution and just that simple effect of shading, as well as increased nutrient and micronutrient availability from things like litter fall, finer turnover, and subsequent microbial activity breaking it all down. Those below ground resources are still elevated after a fire occurs in the Great Basin. Um, and we've been seeing some really interesting research going out. These are just examples of some of those papers where folks are going out and planting sagebrush or bitter brush seedlings um, after a fire has occurred into those remnant canopies to um, capitalize on those elevated resources underneath a sagebrush shrub. Um, and when people go out and plant these seedlings, we're finding like crazy high levels of survival in the canopy relative to the inner space, um, relative to the inner space. Things are a little bit more complicated when we look at grasses, but at least for shrubs, it's been really promising. Um, but the actual sagebrush canopies are kind of missing from this post-fire setting. You're still receiving some of those below ground benefits from living from, from the canopy microsite kind of, um, but you're missing out on a lot of the above ground benefits, mostly being hydraulic lift and shade. So kind of in this preemptive approach that's kind of been talked about a little bit throughout this um, conference, um, what if we think about planting into stands that haven't yet burned? This way we can utilize the sagebrush canopy to increase the establishment rates of understory grasses and forbs at sites like this photo here, um, where there is a sagebrush overstory and there are some perennial grasses and forbs, but there aren't a ton and there's also a lot of cheatgrass. Basically, what would it look like to use sagebrush canopies to increase resistance and resilience before a fire even occurs? Um, and we've been calling this concept preemptive restoration, um, but it's also been referred to as defending the core or like shoring up the sagebrush seed. But basically this idea of let's go in and increase the resistance and the resilience of a system before it even burns in the first place. So we don't have to deal with this post-fire management. Um, and so our, when our research group asked managers if they would be interested in this type of preemptive approach, there were obviously questions about funding, um, but one of the really big barriers was just like, does it work? Like, we're not just going to go out and spend a bunch of time and money on something that may not actually, you know, pan out. Um, and so there's kind of a lot of nuts and bolts questions to get through first before it gets operationalized at like an agency level. Um, and the first one kind of being just like, where should we plant? Um, and our outcomes improved by planting near sagebrush canopies. So sorry, I skipped over this, but this is a paper that um, Carmen just published a couple months ago um, where she interviewed a bunch of land managers at various state and federal agencies. Um, and this is just a quote from them where someone just said, if, if the experiment show that it works, I'd be interested in doing it. And so that's what we're trying to get at is, does it work? <laughs> And I think that um, there's kind of an, not a paradigm per se, but just this idea of the canopy is good and the inner spaces are, are bad. The canopy is good because of that really nice microenvironment and the inner spaces don't have that microenvironment. So maybe it's, a, maybe it's not as good. Um, but I think that that reasoning is not nuanced enough. Um, 
for it's not nuanced enough. Um, the way that I think about the goodness of the canopy and the badness of the inner space is basically the net effect of competition and facilitation. The beneficial microenvironment around a shrub is pulling the ideal place to grow or to be planted in towards the canopy. But the sagebrush itself and the other grasses are not neutral actors. They are going to be competing with those grasses and forbs that we're trying to establish. And they're going to be repelling that like ideal place to grow away from the canopy and kind of into the inner space. Um, there's a paper from Spain and they basically referred to this as facilitation in the halo where like it's kind of these this tension and that ideal place to grow the side of that halo basically is going to be a trade-off between competition and facilitation um, with the idea being that if competition is stronger than facilitation then the best place to grow is going to be somewhere in the inner space if facilitation is stronger than competition, then maybe the best place to grow is somewhere near the canopy. And maybe the best trade-off um, between the two forces is somewhere in the middle. It's not exactly at the canopy and it's not as far away from all sagebrush as you can get, kind of that like inner space microsite. It's somewhere less extreme. Um, and we know from consumer resource theory and from the stress gradient hypothesis that the strength of competition and facilitation is going to change based on a bunch of different things um, that are going to kind of determine the goodness and the badness of the canopy versus the inner space. So what if we plant somewhere in between those two extremes? And that's probably going to change depending on a wet versus a dry year, if we're planting grasses versus forbs. And if we're looking at first versus second year survival and kind of like a seed seedling conflict type of idea. So we asked um, these questions at six different sites all across the Intermountain West. I'm not going to say the Great Basin because there is one site near the Columbia River up at Saddle Mountain, which is a, um, near Tri-Cities, Washington. Um, we established the sites in the summer of 2018 and then Rock Creek out by Heart Mountain burned. Um, in September 2019. So we established a new site at Gray Butte, which is in the exact same climate, but slightly different soils um, than the site that burned. The sites ranged quite a bit with Saddle Mountain being the lowest, driest, and warmest site. Um, and then Onake being the highest and the wettest, and Wilson near Elko, Nevada as the coldest site. They All of the sites have an intact, mature sagebrush canopy. Um, and there is some cheatgrass cover around 40%, and this does vary across sites. Um, and there is perennial grass cover at these sites as well, but it's like not reference conditions by any means. Um, basically all of these sites kind of match this like qualitative criteria that we called at risk, basically being that if they were to burn, they probably are not gonna come back looking too great um, with the functionality that they currently have. There are these great candidates to go in and boost their resistance and resilience by planting grasses and forbs. So we grew out, um, blue bunch wheatgrass and squirrel tail as our two grass species, and then yarrow and globe mallow as our two forb species, with the blue bunch being kind of a deep rooted bunch grass, squirrel tail being more of a medium depth rooted, rooting depth bunch grass, and then yarrow having a shallow fibrous rhizominous root system, and then Globe mallow kind of having more of a taprooty, deeper rooted root system. We luckily had two very different precip years um, in the years that we planted. So we planted out in the fall of 2018, and that was a really wet spring um, where throughout the growing season, so between planting and monitoring, all of these sites received about 130 to 160 percent of normal precip. And then the following year, one site did receive 120% of normal precip, but the rest were all below normal. And so we refer to 2019 as like the drier cohort. And then we tracked their survival. We tracked survival of the first cohort for four years, but only analyzed the first two years. Um, and same with, and then for the second cohort, we tracked it for three years and um, statistically analyzed it for two years. Um, we planted out at multiple distances from the sagebrush canopy. So we planted out at the canopy edge and then kind of at that inner space maximum as far away as all from all possible shrubs that you could get. And then we also planted at two different distances in between. So half of the way between those two extremes and then 25% of the way between the two extremes. But because we know that growing near a small sagebrush is going to yield a much different microenvironment than growing the same distance away from a large sagebrush, we created a 
distance, a metric that incorporates both distance, the distance at which a seedling was planted and the size of that sagebrush. So it's called scale distance. And basically a scale distance of one is at the canopy edge. It's the distance at which a seedling was planted from the base of the shrub divided by the radius of that sagebrush. But that's all to say, one is the canopy edge and then the greater you are, a combination of the further out you are and the smaller the plant is. Um, and so looking at first year survival, um, of globe mallow in the wetter cohort. Um, you know, we kind of started out with this idea of can it be good in our space, bad? And our results kind of follow that where we do see that, um, so the y-axis is percent survival, the x-axis is that scale distance metric, and then this gray line is the canopy edge. And what we're seeing is that survival kind of peaks actually at these intermediate distances between the canopy and inner space extreme. When we look at all the other species that we planted, we see the same pattern or similar pattern for yarrow where survival is highest, high, is highest kind of at that intermediate distance between the two extremes. And then the grasses survival is not affected by distance or proximity to the canopy. Then we look at year two of those same seedlings. So these were growing out in the 2019, 2020 year, which was kind of dry. Um, and we saw that distance no longer mattered. No matter where you were planted, you had an equal probability of survival. And I do want to highlight Roberts. So Roberts is the green line. Globe Mallow at Roberts, every single one survived in the second year. It was really, it was cool. It was weird. We're running with it though. <laughs> um, and then we look at the 2019 cohort. So that was like the drier year. And we just had horrible, horrible survival. Um, Globe mallow did pretty well, and overall Saddle Mountain always had the highest survival rates, um, but generally it was abysmal. So we only included sites where at least five seedlings survived. And so for Yarrow, like only five seedlings survived, at least five seedlings survived at one site at Onaki. Um, and so we didn't see any effect of distance of sagebrush or like the canopy effects kind of influencing survival. Um, and that could be because um, a statistical artifact of just having low a low sample size, or there could be ecological reasons. But regardless, it doesn't matter where, as far as we can tell, it doesn't really matter where you're planted in a drier year. So we kind of go back to our three initial questions. How does climate, species identity, and plant age affect your survival um, with climate? Because it's really weather. We found that in wet years, Forbes uh, respond to distance from the canopy with peak survival kind of being at these intermediate distances. Whereas in dry years, there's no distance effect. With species identity, we found that forbs sometimes respond to distance, but grasses never do. And with plant age, we found that distance to the canopy can act as a first year bottleneck, but it never influences survival in the second year. So our overall conclusions from this are that when proximity to the sagebrush canopy influences survival, survival is high-ish at the canopy, but even higher at those intermediate distances. And so we kind of think about intermediate distances as the word of the day, I guess, bet hedging effects um, or, a bet, you know, you're hedging your bets. It's never a bad idea to plant in the inner space. Either you're going to have high survival there or it's going to be equal everywhere else. And I think that these intermediate distances are a really cool place to be thinking about at a very small scale because these help to close gaps between perennial vegetation. So it's a Reisner paper from 20... 13 or so, maybe 14, um, in which he did structural equation modeling and found that gaps greater than two meters were a very strong indicator of cheatgrass invasion. So if we can kind of go in into these intermediate distances and close in those gaps, that increases our resistance. And plants kind of, grasses planted outside of the canopy can survive a fire. They don't, um, they don't face heat inducing, heat mortality inducing heat loads. Um, once they're planted 50 centimeters away from a canopy edge. And that's work from Hola et al. from 2015. And so with that, um, I'd say plant in the inner plant at those intermediate distances if you're going to go out and do a preemptive approach, but it may not always work. Um, so as Mark mentioned, this paper was just published at Restoration Ecology yesterday. <laughs> um, and I want to thank all of everyone that came out and helped us in the field. It was a ton of work, um, as well as my funding sources, USDA. Utah State Ecology Center, and I was funded by NSF. So with that, 
I'll take questions, or I guess I should leave that option. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we don't have any questions yet, but I have one. Okay. Um, and it's the big one. You know, you, uh, it's the question that you, you praised, you know, with the, that quote you gave where the, the, with the, the manager saying, well, yeah, if it works, I'd be interested. Um, if that same person were to come to you and say, does it work? Yeah, um, I had a slide of overall survival rates and it somehow got deleted, which is embarrassing. Um, but basically, uh, uh, I don't know, it's hard to say. <laughs> so what we found was that at Saddle Mountain, survival was crazy high. There was no herbivory um, and there was because partially because there was no herbivory. Um, basically, no seedling showed any signs of herbivory, of being frost heaved, of just generally being disturbed in general. Um, at other sites, so especially at Birds of Prey, which is just south of Boise, it was right at the edge of a fire. And so we we're kind of in this stand with some sagebrush and just a ton of like dead poa secunda and every single thing got eaten. Like we planted on a Wednesday and then we went back on Thursday and everything had already been eaten by, because that's why we never included Birds of Prey in any of our analyses. Um, like 97% of seedlings show were dead and 74% of those showed signs of disturbance. And so like, it's kind of this trade-off of precip and herbivory. So if I were to, if I were to, if you were to do it, I would say cage your seedlings for sure. And water is never a bad idea. Um, so I think, you know, we had like 70% of survival of globe mallow at Saddle Mountain in the drier year. And so survival can be really high, just also it cannot be as well. We never saw full failure like I have with some certain seeding projects. Um, so I would say maybe, maybe. <laughs> it, de it depends. Yeah, yeah, that was my answer. Yeah. One other question before we, we go. Uh, so, uh, Gregor Siegman says, thanks for a great talk. You described a few different mechanisms by which nurse plants influence and understory plants. Which mechanisms do you think were most or more important in the experiments that you presented? I think, so actually, thanks for asking that question because I, the slide from another chapter that I did that is not yet published, um, but it is my dissertation where we went out and we sampled soils at all of these sites at these same micro sites. So at canopy, inner space, and then half of the way in between and a quarter of the way in between. And we found that these resources remain, or at least like attributes of the micro environment remain elevated um, as you go out into the inner space. So only radiation and potassium really drop off from the canopy microsite to the 25% microsite. Everything else stays pretty high. And so I think that sagebrush our resource islands are not as islandy um, as we think. And so I think that by kind of being planted out a little bit further, you're reducing your competition without really missing out on these things like ammonium nitrate, um, organic matter, soil moisture, um, things like that. I will say that we didn't find any evidence that there was a relationship between distance from the canopy and herbivory. And so I don't think that herbivory protection was really that big of a deal, partially because we didn't plant under the canopy. We planted at the canopy drip line. Okay. And so um, kind of that you could still be eaten by a cow, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks, Sophia. Um, Thank you. And we have... Next, Lena Aoyama is our next speaker. Um, and Lena comes to us from the University of Oregon. So from our easternmost to our westernmost university. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lena. I am a PhD student in the Hallett Lab in um, the University of Oregon. And today I am sharing my work on climate adjusted sea sourcing um, with native grasses um, in the Great Basin. And this is a collaborative work with um, my advisors, Lauren Hallett, Luca Silva, and Stella Copeland, Rory O'Connor. I'm not working here.
my slides are not moving. <laughs> oh, that worked. All right. Plants are often adapted to local conditions such as aridity and temperature. And relying on this relationship, we make choices about native uh, plant material for restoration. For example, we typically use locally sourced seeds or at best seeds from the same uh, seed transfer zones. Sorry, it's getting dark in here. Um, and we do this to avoid maladaptation to the environment and to conserve genetic diversity of native plants. However, uh, we all know that we're experiencing rapid climate change and we are forecasted to see um, global increase in drought frequency and severity. So how do we do um, seed-based rest seed restoration in this climate change? Uh, the seeds selected for restoration now may not survive or persist in variable uh, climate conditions in the future. And this is especially of a high concern in the Great Basin because of as we know, there's um, high frequency of drought um, naturally in the Great Basin, and it's already difficult to get plants to establish from seeds. Um, in the restoration ecology literature, there are lots of emerging ideas on how to adapt to climate change. For example, there's restoration, assisted gene flow to uh, predictive provenance, and all these are thinking about using species or genotypes that uh, will adapt to now and uh, future climates. We'll focus today on climate adjusted provenancing. This was an idea that was proposed by Prober et al in 2015. Um, the idea is to use a mix of genotypes from a climatic gradient bias towards future environmental conditions. Um, so let's take a look at the figure on the right side. The star is where the project site is located and all the green uh, dots are where you would source your seeds. So in B, lo local provenancing means you would simply use seeds from the nearest site. And for clim climate adjusted provenancing, you would mix the local genotype and seeds from drier sites in anticipation of drier climate in the future. Um, so in my study, um, I tested this strategy in the Great Basin rangelands where we are expecting to experience more frequent drought and uh, there is already an increased demand for seed-based restoration after wildfires. We used um, bottle breast squirrel tail, Elemis elamoides, as a focal species. And I did this because it has a relatively high um, success in a survival um, compared to other native grasses in the region. And it has a wide species range in North America, so we can harness the diversity and genotypes in this area. To compare the seedling performance by seed provenance, we collected squirrel tail seeds from six locations across the Great Basin. Um, and the side note, like Sophia, um, the first time I did this, I collected seeds by driving around and uh, collecting wild collected seeds um, and put them in the common garden experiment and they actually got eaten um, by small uh, herbivores. And so I recollected seeds um, by uh, combining purchased seeds and wild collected seeds. And so my approach was doing a common garden experiment at the Northern Great Basin Experimental Range in Riley, um, Oregon. From here on, I'll call this the NGBER. Uh, this is what the site looks like at the common garden site. Um, it's a sagebrush step and we uh, constructed these drought shelters um, by clearing the area, fencing area with um, 
adapt the fences to exclude cattle um, and constructed these drought shelters that passively shielded the rain year round um, and created three rainfall treatments. Uh, one is ambient with 0% cover. Um, second one is moderate drought with 50% cover. And the third one was severe drought with 80% cover. The moderate drought uh, um, reduced about 50% of the mo soil moisture and the severe drought reduced about 64% of the soil moisture. And multiply this by eight blocks, we have 24 plots in total. And within these plots, we had seeding treatments. Um, we sowed 300 squirrel tail seeds from different seed sources. And this was done in October, 2020. In the following two uh, growing seasons, we did a demography census um, every month and counted live and dead seedlings. Um, Native perennial grasses can live for a long time, but we focused on the first two years because seedlings are more vulnerable to uh, frost and dry periods in the summer. And emergence is the biggest bottleneck as um, many of us have already uh, mentioned. And I see, I've seen reports that um, only less than 10% of the seedlings survive the first growing season. This is a picture of what the plot looks like. Um, we kept track of live and dead seedlings every month by putting these um, metal rings around individuals that are alive. To rank the seed sources by climate, we obtained long-term average climate data from NOAA uh, that are ecologically important for plant growth in the first two years. So that included mean annual precipitation, vapor pressure deficit, and max air temperature in July. That's uh, late in the growing season. Minimum air temperature in uh, March, which is early in the growing season, and total number of days above um, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. We also included um, number of days below um, 32 Fahrenheit. Uh, to see if that uh, correlated with some of these um, variables and it correlated with the, the air temperature in March. So I excluded that one. Um, and we collapsed these climate variables in a multivariate space uh, using a principal component analysis. Here the X axis show the first two best fit models that explain the most variation across six seat sources. And the distance among points are representing dissimil dissimilarity in climate of seat sources. So closer you are, the closer in climate, the farther you are, uh, um, the more di different uh, the climates are. And again, the NGBR is the common garden site. Um, according to the x-axis, uh, two variables that explain 45% of the variation were number of days above 90% or 90 uh, degrees Fahrenheit and max air temperature in July. And so all the points were located to the left of the NGBR, which means the common garden site was the coolest site among um, all the seeds planted. And according to the y-axis, two variables I explained, 28% of the variation were mean annual precipitation and July um, vapor pressure deficit. And NGBR is located in the middle of this dry to wet gradient. And so there were some sites that are wetter and some sites that were drier than the common garden site. My hypothesis was that seeds from similar climate as the local site will perform best in ambient conditions. So in this case, Roaring Springs has the shortest distance in the PCA uh, graph. So 
I thought Roaring Springs will do best in the ambient. And my second hypothesis is that seeds from warmer and drier seed source do better in drought. So a uh, far left corner of the graph has Little Sahara and Elko as warmer and drier sites. Um, so one metric of restoration success is seedling survival density at the end of the second growing season. And here I'm showing the final density of squirrel tail individuals in year two uh, on the y-axis. And the x-axis shows the seed provenance um, in order from wet to dry. We found no significant difference in seedling survival across um, sea sources in ambient and severe drought. But in moderate drought, we observed two clear winners, Vale and Little Sahara. Uh, two of these populations um, had sig significantly higher density at the end of the second growing season than other seed sources. Let's look at the climate uh, of these seed sources. Um, Vail and Little Sahara were both uh, warmer than the, the common garden, but Vail was wetter and Little Sahara is drier than the common garden site. So we think this contributed to um, drought tolerance strategies. Um, even though they had the similar um, outcome in year two, they had a different um, emergence style in year one. So here, gray, bot, uh, gray bars represent the cumulative seedling emergence throughout the gr first growing season. So remember I um, measured or counted how many seedlings were alive and dead um, every month. So I um, added up all the live seedlings and subtracted the mortality and come up with the total seedling that emerged that first season and found that seeds from wetter locations, including Vale and Susanville, had higher seedling performance under drought conditions compared to other seed sources. But this high emergence came with the cost of high mortality in the summer. So at the end of, um, so these black bars are representing the final density at the end of the growing season, the first growing season. So the differences between the gray and the black bars represent the mortality uh, in the first year. And seeds from Thale had higher emergence, uh, but also higher mortality, while seeds from Little Sahara had lower emergence, but a higher survival rate. We wanted to see if this uh, higher survival rate in Little Sahara or drier locations was look, um, has anything to do with tolerating a uh, drought better. And so we measured carbon isotope signatures in seedling leaves. Um, in our second year, at the end of the second year, and um, carbon isotopes uh, can be a metric of high water use efficiency. Um, so on the y-axis, I have a delta 13C. The lower you are, a higher water use efficiency. And we found significantly higher water use efficiency in Little Sahara seedlings compared to other sites. And we think that this um, physiological response to aridity uh, contributed to higher survival rate in Little Sahara in the second year. Um, my key takeaway is that uh, one, um, seedlings, uh, well, seeding seeds from um, warmer locations sometimes increase, but not all the time, um, the seedling density and moderate drought conditions. Um, and this, this was the results we saw in the, the second year, but if we look at the um, first year um, survival rate, then we can see differences in uh, drought tolerances. Um, so seeds from wetter sites, bale, 
had higher emergence um, but risked higher mortality in the drier uh, period and seeds from Little Sahara, which was a drier site than the common garden site, had a lower mortality and higher water use efficiency. So for managers, uh, some implications I can think of is that we um, may want to consider uh, not only source climate of the seeds that we are seeding, but their drought tolerance strategies at the seedling stage. And we can kind of only get that um, by doing experiments, but uh, that can be a factor that's, that could be included. Um, and lastly, integrating multiple seed sources. Um, so local genotypes and um, seeds from warmer sites into a seed mix may be a potential climate adaptation strategy for seed selection um, in the future. I would like to thank my lab, um, Hallett Lab, and researchers at the Eastern Oregon Agriculture Research Center and my collaborators listed here. Thank you all uh, for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thanks, Lena. <clears throat> um, see, we don't have any questions yet. We do have some clapping. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I'm intrigued by this idea that some drier sites are better than others. Um, do you have any sense of why you think that water use efficiency is particularly good at Little Sahara? Is it, is it plant oriented or is it something to do with, you know, so it might be particularly just this particular seed source at this particular site, or do you think it has something more to do with the environment itself? Mm. Yeah, I don't um, know for sure, but I, this site, Little Sahara was the, um, the driest site among all of them. And um, if I rank them, rank all the seed sources by the um, vapor pressure deficit, that's that has the highest um, deficit there. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, um, plants do adapt to wherever they're grown. So I think it's in their um, gene to to adapt to dry conditions. Um, but I do want to mention that this Little Sahara was a purchased seed and um, it was actually grown in Washington. And so there's a little bit of <laughs> complication where, um, you know, the seed source was the dry site, but it was grown and bulked up in a wet site. <laughs> hmm. That's really interesting. Um, so it's possible that they're selected for high survival rate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lauren asks, based on your results, what do you see as the next step for this line of research if you were going to go forward? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think there needs to be, so my, I, I was hoping that the clear um, relationship will show up with, you know, warmer and drier sites, you would have um, higher survival. And it's not really the case, like some, some sites will do best and some sites really don't show that much difference as the local sites. And so I wanna add in um, more sites and see if this is like a, a generalizable um, relationship. Um, and also I have a mix of um, purchased seeds and the wild seeds and so, um, also wanna see it, the difference in those two types. And I know practically um, people will be buying um, purchased seed, seeds um, and the local seeds are a little difficult to find. Okay. And you're just a comment from Francis Kilkenny too that, um, that they're finding in, in the work that, that he's doing with the Forest Service that 
uh, and with their squirrel tail work that releases are they are adaptively different than the collected populations. So the collected populations are showing signatures of these local adaptations, but the but seed releases aren't. So mm -hmm. great. Well, thanks, Lena. Um, Thank you. And we will. Um, we've got <clears throat> one more research presentation. We've got two more talks. We've got one more that's a research presentation. Um, and that's from Laura Schreiber. And there's Laura. Um, <clears throat> so Laura is a relatively recent graduate of the University of Nevada, Reno, and now working at USGS, the USGS lab in Flagstaff. Awesome. Hi. So I'm Laura Schreiber. I'm an ecologist at the USGS in Flagstaff, but I just graduated from the University of Nevada, Reno, where I was working with Dr. Beth Ledger. And I'll be sharing some of my thesis work with you today, specifically looking at non-target effects of amazopic and endazoflam on Great Basin native annual forbs and seeded squirrel tail. And before I get started, I want to thank the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for funding my research. Working on getting my slides to advance. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so y'all might be sick of this by now, but I'm still going to say it. The <laughs> grass fire cycle is really detrimental in Great Basin ecosystems. So cheatgrass is an invasive annual grass that really increases fire risk and frequency. And the native plants of the Great Basin aren't adapted to frequent fires. So with repeated fires, ecosystems can turn into monocultures of cheatgrass and other invasive species. And herbicides are one of the best tools we have to deal with cheatgrass and other invasive annual grasses. And there are two main herbicides that are primarily used for cheatgrass. There's amazopic, which has been out since 1996, and indazoflam, which is relatively newer. And both of these herbicides have pre-emergent effects, which mean they target seeds and prevent them from germinating and growing. So this makes them really great at treating, treating invasive annual plants like cheatgrass that grow from seed every year. And they tend not to have too much negative effects on perennial vegetation and can even benefit perennial vegetation. However, native annual plants and seeds and seedlings of perennial plants are vulnerable to non-target effects. So non-target effects to annual plants are particularly concerning in the Great Basin because native annual plants, especially native annual forbs, are critical components of Great Basin ecosystems and they're often food for wildlife like the greater sage grouse. However, it can be really hard to evaluate the effects of herbicides on native annuals in a field setting because of their ephemeral nature. They don't emerge every year and they're only out for a short amount of time and they might not leave much litter behind. So this has led to native annual forbs being underrepresented in herbicide experiments in the Great Basin. And I'm not saying that to blame researchers or land managers. I personally know how hard this is as another part of my research. I evaluated the effects of these herbicides in a natural field setting near Elko County. And even when I surveyed in the spring, I found very few native annual forbs above ground. But I also collected soil for a seed bank study and found that they're actually a really big component of the seed bank. I just wasn't catching them above ground. So overall in this study, I found that herbicides reduce non-native plants and tended to benefit perennial plants. But that study is leaving out annual forbs and they're a really important part of ecosystems. So luckily I had a unique opportunity at UNR to evaluate the effects of herbicides on native annual forbs. So my advisor, Dr. Beth Ledger and others have been growing native annual forbs in a field at the Valley Road Greenhouse Center at the university for several years. So it has a really rich native annual forb seed bank. And several of these species are part of the greater sage grouse's diet. And some of them had never been addressed in relation to herbicides. And in this field, I also took advantage of, so I also took advantage of this field to test how planting depth interacted with herbicide treatment for seeded squirrel, seeded perennial grass squirrel tail, Elimus elemis elevoides. And Lena, I was seeing your little circle things and it reminded me of my toothpicks and spending hours squatting, looking at squirrel tail on the ground. <laughs> so this is the layout of the experiment at UNR. I had, so our greenhouse manager, Scott Huber sprayed Amazopic and Dazaflam and their combination. And we also applied these herbicides at full and reduced rates to mimic the effect that litter has in a natural field setting. 
And for reference, this is what the plots looked like before we sprayed. And they were completely plowed. There was no litter present, which is why we use reduced rates to mimic litter effects. So in this first experiment, what we're asking is how each herbicide of treatment affected native annual forb and non-native weed emergence. And we hypothesized that the herbicides would negatively affect both native annual forbs and weeds, but that there would be differences among species. And we also asked how, how the effects would differ at full and reduced rates and expected kind of naturally that full rates would lower plant destiny more than reduced rates. So let's get into how the herbicides affected native annual forbs. So these graphs have density on the y-axis and treatment on the x-axis with control in green, imazepic full red, reduced pink, and dazaflam full blue, reduced light blue, and combination full purple, reduced light purple. So we saw that native plant density was lower in all of the herbicide treatments compared to the control plots, which are this green on the left. But this pink and this blue, these are the half rate imazepic and dazaflam, and native plant density was higher in the half rate than its companion full rate. So this is really exciting because it suggests that land managers could apply herbicides at reduced rates to in areas rich with native annual forbs to reduce some of those negative effects. And in case you're a species nerd and want to know what annual forbs these were, um, our most common native annual forb was Amsinchia tessellata. We also had Menzelia vecchiana, Microstris gracilis, and Calinzia parvifolia. And this is the same graph as before, just with the species breakdown. And you might notice that Calinzia was pretty much only present in control plots. And to illustrate this point, this, this picture has a control plot outlined in red on the left and an endazoplan full plot on the right. And we had a really big Menzelia year. They were all over the control plots, some of the interspaces, but we really weren't seeing them in the treatment plots. So next we asked how herbicides affected non-native plants and how rates differed. So we found that the levels of non-native plants were lower in herbicide plots than treatment plots. And we saw that the reduced rate plots, this light pink, this, this pink and this light blue that were higher with the native annual forms, they controlled non-natives just as effectively as the full rates. So that's also really, really promising because maybe reduced rates can help ameliorate negative effects to native annuals while still reducing non-native species. And for our species breakdown here, we had a lot of Malvin neglecta and Salsola tragus. And these were higher in the control plots, but they were a little bit more resistant than our other most common invasives, Duscrania sophia and Lactuca seriola, which are pretty much only present in control plots. And here's another photo that illustrates that. We had a big Descarania season in one of our years. This is a control plot full of Descarania sophia. Then this is a combination full plot with barely any plants in it. So it is really effective at producing Descarania. So next I asked if tolerance levels differed among native annual forms. So these tables don't have a control. Instead, the values are the percent difference from the control to the treatment. And we have each treatment up here. And so a red, a red, sorry, a red treatment indicates that the density was higher in control than treatment. So basically the herbicide is reducing that plant and the darker red, the more it was reduced. Whereas on the other hand, blue means that the species actually had higher density in the treatment than control plots. So the species wasn't as negatively affected by that treatment. And so a few things I wanna point out, Calinzia parvifolia really did not like herbicides. It was reduced by nearly 100% in most of the treatments compared to control. Then Menzelia vecchiana also wasn't a big fan, but it was a little bit less harmed in the endazoplam half plots. And this is the last time I'll show you that field of Menzelia, but yeah, this really illustrates that herbicides reduced Menzelia. On the other hand, Amsinchia tessellata and Microsteris gracilis were still negatively affected in full rate plots, but in Amazepic and Endazoplam half rate plots, they were either not as affected or there was actually higher density of these species in the treatment and the control plot. So all of these are annual species, but herbicide tolerance can differ among species and plant families. So it's important to assess the effects of herbicides on as many species as possible to inform land management. 
And this photo demonstrates Amsinkia's red relative tolerance to herbicides. This is a side view with multiple plots. And these plants are pretty much all young am Amsinkias and they were growing in control and herbicide plots. So lastly, let's look at my depth experiment. So in this experiment, I planted Elemis elamoides seeds at five different depths in each plot to see how depth and treatment interacted. So we asked how planting depth affects emergence in different herbicide treatments. And we hypothesized that we could find a kind of Goldilocks depth that was just right, where the seeds weren't planted so deep that they couldn't emerge, but were planted a little deeper than usual so they could escape the negative effects of the herbicides. And we thought that this Goldilocks depth would be between three and five centimeters. And for reference, LMS elamoide seeds are usually planted no deeper than 1.3 centimeters. So each of these graphs represents a treatment with control here, amazepic, indazaflam, and combination plots. And the x-axis shows planting depth. We planted at one, two, three, five, and 10 centimeters. And the y-axis is percent emergence, which is fixed among these plots so we can directly compare results. So in all treatments, seeds emerged most at one, two, and three centimeters, and there were always drop-offs at five and 10 centimeters. So five and 10, a little bit too deep to be planting these seeds. In control plots, one, two, and three centimeters has similar emergence. However, in imazepic half, imazepic full, and in dazoflam half plots, two and seeds planted at two and three centimeters consistently had higher emergence than seeds planted at one, one centimeter. So in these treatments, two to three centimeters could be our Goldilocks depth. We also found that treatments that contained indazoflam, these four on the bottom here, had lower emergence than treatments with imazopec. So this is for relevant for land managers who may be seeding LMS alongside herbicide application as they may want to use imazopec and plant seeds between two and three centimeters instead of the usual about one centimeter. So in summary, we learned that herbicides can reduce non-native plants and that these reductions were similar at full and reduced rates. We also saw that native annual forbs were harmed by herbicides, but that the effects were slightly offset at lower rates and that some species were more tolerant than others. Lastly, we learned that indazoflam lowered emergence for Elemis elamoides more than imazopic, and that planting seeds at two to three centimeters can help offset some of the negative effects in amazopic and reduce rate in dazaflam plots. So let's move on to applications, the arguably most exciting part. So land managers could consider surveying for native annual forbs and consider using reduced rates or make efforts to protect, protect them and reintroduce them after herbicide application, like collecting seed on site and then reseeding after application, maybe with protective treatments like carbon ponds. Land managers could also consider using species that are more a bit more resistant to herbicides, potentially, like Amsinchia tessellata or Microsteris cacillus. And lastly, when planting Elemis elamoides, land managers could consider using imazopic or reduced rate and dazaflam and plant a little deeper than usual at two to three centimeters. So with that, I'd like to thank my funder, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, my collaborators, John Tull, William Katowski, and Paul Myman with the Fish and Wildlife Service and Cooperative Extension, my advisor, our greenhouse manager, Jerry Team for Plant ID, and my lab mates and technicians. And with that, I will take any questions. Well, great. Thanks, Laura. <clears throat> um, I don't see any questions yet. Um, I'm wondering about, oh, Matt Germino has raised his hand. Mm -hmm. Really it. nice presentation. Uh, your findings on depth, I, I think, are super, super important. Um, so can you, uh, we missed a detail though. So you, you got the seeds into the ground and then you applied the herbicide? And yes, how, that's correct. Can you just say again what the timing was on, on that? That's that's a critical part of the story, right? Yeah, we so we planted the seeds in, I believe, the fall. It's been almost three years now, but I believe we planted the seeds in the fall. We did that by gluing them to toothpicks at various steps and drilling holes in the ground. We planted them in the fall, then applied the herbicides with a moving 
tractor that went over the toothpicks and just sprayed on top of them. So they hadn't had a chance to emerge yet. So we watched how they emerged in the control plots versus the different herbicide treatment plots. Ah, toothpick procedures. <clears throat> My condolences. <laughs> <laughs> I glued a lot of Elevis to toothpicks. It was, um, we know I don't know if I call it fun. It was interesting. Yeah, we know all about <laughs> that. It's amazing that the herbicide didn't run down the toothpicks into the seed. You got a preferential yeah. path there. But then again, you're applying the herbicide. Do you know what the um, the carrier rate was on that? Um, yes, I have a slide with rates in case anyone asked. So Amazepic full, we did five ounces an acre and reduced, we did 2.5. In, in, in Dazaflam full, we did six ounces an acre, reduced 4.5. Then combinations full were just the combinations yeah. of those rates. Yeah. yeah. What about your carrier rate though? Like how much, what was the gallons per acre of water? That I don't know off the top of my head. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Um, I, early on in your talk, you talked about how you had difficulty finding these um, annual forbs mm -hmm. when you were looking for them. And then at the end you suggested that agencies might want to monitor to see what kinds of annual forbs they've got out there. Do you have any thoughts on how that might be made feasible given that we're not out there all the time? Yeah, I think definitely tailoring the time of year you're out there due to logistics. I was out there probably a little too late to catch them. I think going out in early April and ideally after winter precipitation could be a best bet. And yeah, I wonder if maybe there's AIM data on areas that have certain annual forbs. I mean, some areas you're gonna get to, it's just a monoculture of cheatgrass, so you might not expect there to be much native annual forbs, but other areas can have cheatgrass in a coexisting plant community where you wanna get down the cheatgrass, but really benefit the native plant community that's still there. And I feel like those are the sites where it could be worth the effort to try to protect or amplify native annual forbs in some kind of way. Great. Well, thanks, Laura. Yeah. Um, we have one last talk. And, you know, Corey has been managing everything for us here, you know, keeping track and moving people around and making sure that everybody could speak. And, and she's really been contributing a whole lot. This, this present whole session wouldn't have worked without her. But now she's going to, to share some of her work. Um, and the way this, we started off with a manager with Allison Onyre talking about management applications. And then we had this parade of research to try and help improve, you know, give information to managers, but wanted to end with, again, a, a more management and practical focus talk. And so uh, Corey's gonna tell us about a project she's been working on for quite a long time that, um, I think has great potential to help uh, um, people, especially add Forbes to, to our restoration seed mixes. Right. So yeah, I feel a bit like Oz coming out from the behind the curtain. So, um, but thanks for sticking it out. Um, I'm happy to uh, describe to or introduce you to or update you a on the Western Forbes Biology, Ecology, and Use and Restoration Project. It's a project designed to aid seed collectors, seed growers, landowners, and land managers as they and we increase the supply and use of native forbs and restoration. The project largely involves the work of myself and Nancy Shaw. Um, most of you probably know Nancy Shaw. Um, but she's a retired restoration researcher and practitioner. Um, so my background is really um, vegetation ecology and synthesis writing. Um, and then Nancy, you know, she has the real um, restoration and practical experience that um, I think the two of us make a pretty good team, um, but she keeps me in check. Like all good projects, the Western Forbes um, website now is a collaborative effort 
and it's supported by and funded by the agencies and groups you see here. But primary funding has um, come from the BLM for this project. So why Forbes? Um, they're critical to the structure, function, resilience, and diversity of ecosystems. They come in a variety of forms, and this allows them to occupy and tie up space and resources, making them unavailable to non-native plants. They're important to the diets of a whole host of wildlife species. They're essential to sustaining pollinator populations and invertebrate populations that are important to our birds. And, you know, a world without wildflowers is just a drab one that no one wants to imagine. So while the importance of Forbes has long been recognized, the knowledge necessary to be successful in using them in restoration has really trailed that of grasses and shrubs. There's a lot of reasons for that, but over the past 25 years or more, there's been a push by land management agencies, researchers, laboratories, and industry to close this knowledge gap. So that multidisciplinary effort produced a lot of knowledge, but it's now widely scattered. So the main objective of the Western Forbes project has been to find, gather, and synthesize this information. This information that exists in published literature, unpublished protocols, and data on um, agency computers. So it involves thorough literature searches where we consult multiple databases, as well as our growing hard copy and digital libraries. So just to give you an example, um, the review for air leaf balsam root, we went through, sifted through more than 750 citations. And the review for this species that's posted online includes a reference section of 180 citations. The list of species that we um, have prioritized and are working from um, on the project came from the BLM. It includes forb species that are important in the Great Basin and Western US, but it prioritizes those species that were researched in the multidisciplinary effort that I just mentioned. And then um, also those forb species that are currently being grown for seed production. So initially, um, the synthesized information for this project was made to users in interactive PDF files that we housed on um, a web page on the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange website. But today we have um, transitioned it onto its own website, and there's the that's the um, URL there. Um, but this changing it to this kind of a format is hope. The plan is that this will make um, the time between finalizing text and content and making it publicly available, we will shorten that time. And it also is improving the process of updating the existing species reviews. Um, we are in the process of developing a plan for doing that on a more regular basis. The other thing this does is it provides a template that can be used in another location. If there's another region that wants to develop, um, you know, Eastern Forbes, that's that's definitely an option. The species tab is where you find each of the reviewed Western Forbes species. There's 40 available currently. Um, so at, when we were changing this from the PDF format to this website, um, some of you might be familiar with that other um, with that other web page with the PDFs. Um, we were still working on new species. So in this transition, um, there were there are six new reviews that maybe you've never seen if you haven't been to this website. Um, they include four penstemon species and two nitrogen fixing species, lemon scurf pea and American vetch. The species are listed alphabetically by scientific name, and you click on the name, it brings up everything we've researched and summarized for that Forbes species. The information gathered for each species is deliberately exhaustive, at least as it relates to these major buckets or categories of information. 
For each Forbes species, the general biology and ecology information is presented first. Um, those sections are followed by um, information that addresses seed collection, seed production, nursery production, and wildland restoration. Each of the sections you see here is, they're further divided um, into categories, related categories that sort of help the reader navigate these dense um, reviews, but it also allows us to be a little bit more flexible because none of these is exactly the same. You'll find one with a bunch of information and then one where you drop that category altogether. Um, and as I indicated, we have 40 species and these um, the process is we post these reviews online as soon as they're finalized. And that's a process that includes getting two or more researchers or managers familiar with the species to provide edits and comments to our drafts. So here is the list of Western Forbes species reviewed to date. So let's just dive into um, what what I mean when I'm saying species reviews. Um, so I'll just do it by just going through specific examples uh, into each section. So in the distribution section, this is where you would learn about the plants, plant where it occurs, um, the climates and soils and other plants it's associated with. Um, and in this example, the distribution section for parsnip flower buckwheat you'd learn that this species occurs in fairly small populations along the northern fringe of the central Great, Brace, Great Basin, it becomes more dominant in the Columbia Basin, Snake River Plain, and in southeastern Oregon, commonly grows a big sagebrush, antelope bitterbrush, and large populations are found where you have gravelly soils and rocky, gravelly soils on rocky ridges. In the description section, this is where you learn about the plant growth form and characteristics that are useful to um, identification of the plant in the field um, and maybe its subtaxa if there is any, if there are any. The general description of the plant's growth habit, stature, a more detailed description of the stems and leaves and fruits are provided. In this example, Fernleaf Biscuru, the dis description section tells you that this species is a sturdy, large, long-lived perennial that can reach up to five feet tall. It produces roots up to two inches thick that reach more than two feet deep. Leaves are pinnately or ternate pinnately dissected into fern-like fern -like leaflets. And 50 to 200 tiny yellow flowers are produced in large compound umbels. The species produces schizocarp fruits that you see here. Schizocarps are comprised of two mericarps, or the individual seeds, and they remain attached along their midlines mid until the, they're ripe. In the ecology section, you learn about plant growth and lifespan as it relates to disturbances. This is also where the plant's importance to wildlife is discussed. Any indigenous uses or um, current medicinal importance are addressed. The ecology section for in this case, American vetch indicates that the species is an early colonizer, common on disturbed sites, but it also grows in late cereal and climax vegetation. Although shade tolerant, its abundance is often greater in full sun or partial, partial shade. There are reports that seed can be ejected up to 16 feet from the pod when it splits. When emergence of American vetch was compared in sterilized soils and native soils containing rhizobia, the emergence was much slower in sterilized soils. Throughout its growing season, American vetch provides forage to a variety of wildlife from grizzly bears to bees, and it's highly palatable to cattle, sheep, and horses. It's in the developing a seed supply section where you find a lot of the information related to seed collection and seed storage. Within this section for limestone hawksbeard, you learn that the seeds generally ripe once the pappus is visible in the seed head, this is often in June or July, because seed sets indeterminate and insect damage is an issue for the species, the planning and monitoring and inspection are critical to wildland seed collection. Like I said, a good indicator of seed ripeness is, the, is when you see the white pappus hair sticking out from the top of a closed seed head. And if you harvest before this time, 
you can dramatically increase the amount of non-viable seed you're collecting. In this next picture, you see that milky juice is produced when the stems um, or other herbage of the plant is clipped or damaged. This is a characteristic of the, of the crepus genus, but it also means that your seed, your seed collection needs special care to prevent molding. The vegetative material like stems and leaves collected with the seed should be removed from the collection as soon as possible. And you should keep your collections in a breathable container with good air circulation. And of course, protect your um, collections, the containers that you have your collections in, keep those in a dry shaded location to protect from overheating. It's in the wildland seeding and planting section that you learn about the methods suggested as best restoration management practices. And sadly, this is probably, or is often the sparsest section for each review, which follows what we know about wildland restoration and the limited use of Forbes to date. In this example, the review indicates that establishment of air leaf balsam root can be good with good seedbed preparation, proper seeding depths, and rodent deterrence especially at upper elevation range on sites because of its slow growth rate should be seeded in rows separate from rapidly developing species to reduce competition and improve the growth and survival of seedlings. For this review, I spent a lot of hours on the phone with the late Steve Monson who recommends drill seeding in the fall at depths of at least one inch. Seedlings grow slowly and even under the best growing conditions, plants require three to five years to reach reproductive maturity. So I hope I've, in those last examples, made it clear that the Western Forbes syntheses are as complete and detailed as the current literature and published knowledge allows. They represent a comprehensive treatment of the species. And because of this, we've been developing a couple of spin-off products and resources that um, present the information in another way, a more summarized or um, easier to um, search way. One such resource is the lookup table. It's a resource you can access from the home page. It's an extensive table that provides data related to each Forbes species. Well, okay, that's not true. Um, it includes, I think it last check, 24 of the 40 species. So it's a bit of a work in progress still, um, but the data for each species um, spans a hundred columns. So information in the table is presented in the same order as it is in the review. So that your data for plant taxonomy, biology and ecology is followed by data and details important to seed collection, seed storage, plant materials development. And the table has been developed using a database structure so it can be filtered and searched based on the user's criteria. So we hope that this could be useful um, maybe when you're building a seed mix. So it would allow you to find and select early, mid and late flowering species, or say you wanted to um, inform your seeding arrangement so you could group your rapidly and slowly establishing species together. So but because the table is so extensive, we grouped and color coded the data as you see here. And these numbers that are below um, these colored categories or boxes represent the number of columns associated with each of these information categories. If you click on a species row within the table, that will bring up the entirety of data that we have available for that selected species in a vertical format. So then you can scroll down to see the data fields and data details related to the selected species. Um, it's important to note that we're still inputting data for each Forbes species already posted on the website. And we're still working on a few bugs related to the filtering operations, but for the most part, it's it's operational. Um, if, if you do run into trouble, I would appreciate you could you can let me know. Another companion resource that is in production now is a field guide. Um, this field guide provides select information from those sections of the review that provide important clues 
to field identification of the plant, as well as a brief summary of its reproductive strategies and ecology as it relates to disturbance and wildlife importance. The field guide is going to be a hard copy printed resource, and it will be organized such that the opening of the guide allows the user to view both short summary pages at once. So the page you see here would be above a center spine. And this page with um, notes and details, especially helpful to seed collectors, would be below the center spine. The page provides a brief description of the distribution and habitats associated with the species, the plant communities, soils, elevations, and precipitations associated with its habitats. The page also provides characteristics of ripe and filled seed, as well as any tips and tricks related to short-term seed storage and methods that should make for successful planting of the seed. The first volume of the field guide will include 30 of the 40 species that are online now. And we hope to have the guide ready to print uh, maybe in June. Each species description within the guide also provides a link back to the complete online species review with the QR code. So you can get all the more, the more detailed information here. So that is the Western Forbes project to date anyway. Um, so I appreciate you uh, hanging out for the rest of the day to get here. Um, and I also need to thank like um, all the people who've been instrumental in um, bringing this project to where it is today. Nancy Shaw, who I already mentioned, and Anna Helford are really the real reason the project exists at all. Matt Fisk developed all the species distribution maps um, within each species review online and in our field guide. Um, Tessa Bartz has put a ton of time into populating and improving the function of the lookup table. And Shane O'Shannon has been um, doing the web development for us. And I also need to thank many, many researchers and practitioners who've provided input and edits to my draft species reviews, but there's too many to name. Um, but maybe if, there might even be some on the on the meeting. So if you're here, thank you. And I'm sure I'll be bugging you in the future again. But if you guys, um, I can take questions if you have any. Um, um. Yeah, I don't see any questions yet. There is a comment from Ed Kleiner from Comstock Seeds. He says, Hi, Ed. <laughs> one thing he says, which sounds good, is that they're getting more approvals for some of their more, uh, you know, this <clears throat> more expensive quote. So, you know, uh, mixes that are, are have more Forbes often are local source. But um, he does list a couple of problems they challenge. They don't they don't have extension rec extensive records on cleaning and testing. Um, their acquisition at remote locations is challenging, especially if they're at higher elevations, because you might we had get snowed out before the before the seeds reach maturation. Um, and local climate last climate volatility is challenging as we get intense winds and rain events, and so many forbs are delicate. So you know, we still have a lot of challenges to to meet before we can really get Forbes more effectively into uh, into restoration projects. But there's a lot of good things happening, and I think the Forbes book is probably one of them. Yeah, well, and I and it's probably worth noting that this is also sort of a jumping off point. You know, it's it's sort of synthesizing what's been published and um, is known. So that's why um, the idea of being able to um, update these regularly, I think is going to be useful mm -hmm. um, because we don't, we don't know. There's a lot we don't know still. Um, but I do think this, hopefully this resource provides a jumping off point for um, People want to get in the game. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because you're right. A world without wildflowers is not worth considering. <laughs> no. So <clears throat> with that, 
I want to thank everybody who who came um, to participated in, or in as speakers or who um, has sat through this session. We started six hours ago <laughs> uh, and I know I'm wiped out and I didn't even do anything. Uh, and so, but um, I think we've had, I feel like we've, we've had a very successful um, session this today and a, a good annual meeting and I hope all of you will consider if you are not already joining the Society for Ecological Restoration and becoming a participant in the Great Basin section, because there's a lot of, lot of really great ideas and brain power here, and we would love to be able to learn from you. And with that, I'm going to, well, I guess Corey's the one who has to shut us down. <laughs> Thanks all yeah, very much. You have to ask Oz. That's right. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Mark. Thanks, everybody. And I will stop now. Okay. <laughs>